Bapak. lupa apa namanya kok ada kesibukan tidak diingatkan oleh Mbak Lima Bapak jangan terlambat loh Pak G oh, ini kok pembicaranya dari dari banyak dari mancanegara ya Pak G Iya Pak sesi kita lintas negara Pak Wah, luar biasa ini Indonesia, Tadi, Jepang, dan Taiwan. Cara berikutnya dari Uzbekistan, dari uh, Nederland, wah luar biasa. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, saya selama ini yang berkomunikasi dengan Ibu Halima. Iya. Terima kasih kesediaannya, Prof. Alhamdulillah. Eh, sami sami. Oh, <laughs> tunggu, 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 tunggu wetan rumah. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the plenary session of the first international conference on teaching practicum and on practicum and community service, uh, ICOP COSI. And we are now in the uh, fourth plenary session. And already together with us here, uh, three speakers from three different universities from three different countries. Exactly, we have four speakers. The first speaker is Professor Insinyur Irfan Dwidya Priambada, MAng PhD. He is from Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. And then the second speaker is Associate Professor Antoni Gerard Ryan and Associate Professor Takahiko Matsui from IG University of Education, Japan. And then the third is Professor Kuo Ping Lin from Tuanghai University, Taiwan. The three speakers are going to share with us the practices in their universities in relation to student community service, teaching practicum, and internships. Chairing the session is Bapak Tri Sugiarto M. Hum. Would you please take the floor? Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Nuni. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace and God's blessing be upon you all and good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to be here in the fourth plenary session of the first international conference on practicum and community services in education this afternoon. My name is Tisuki Arto. I'm the chair of this plenary session. This afternoon, as what Bu has mentioned to you, we are having the pleasure of joining the presentation of four presenters for three, from three different universities and from three different countries. They are Professor Insinyur Irfan Dwidya Priyambodo, PhD from Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia, Associate Professor Anthony Carroll Ryan, and Associate Professor Taha, Takahiko Matsui from Aichi University of Education, Japan, and Professor Kuo Ping Li from Tunghai University, Taiwan. Today, the presenters will be discussing our topic of interest related to sharing practices of practicum and community service in education in the university. Dear participants, Baba and Ibu, please be well informed that the plenary session will last for about two hours. 30 minutes will be allocated for each presenter to deliver their presentation and for the rest 30 minutes, we will be having a question and answer. Questions, comments, or suggestions will be welcome after all presentations have been given. 
To begin with, I'd like to read the CVs of our first presenter, Professor Irfan Twitia Priyamboto, MM, PhD. Bye-bye, Nimpu. Professor uh, Priyamboto obtained PhD degree from the Department of Fermentation Technology, Faculty of Engineering, Osaka University in 1999 several times invited to be visiting researcher at the Department of Biotechnology, Faculty of Engineering, Osaka University, Osaka, College of Agriculture in Ibaraki University. He has been appointed as a professor of agricultural microbiology since 2014. And then since 20, uh, 2015 has also been appointed as an adjunct professor at the Department of Biotechnology, Faculty of Engineering, Osaka University. From 2012 up to 2015, he had been appointed as a vice chairman for the director of Institute for Research and Community Services, Universitas Gajah Mada. And since 2015 has been appointed as the director of the Directorate for Community Services, Universitas Gajah Mada. Among community service activities, advocacy for handling refugees through the concept of one family, one brotherhood was published in the Jakarta Post on November 20, 2010. The concept was then applied in this thing at the foot of Mount Merapi until now. Activities to invite residents at the foot of Mount Merapi to rest against difficulties after the volcanic eruption 2010 was reported in proceeding of the National Academy of Science of the United States of America April uh, 16, 2016, while activities in utilizing Tweet Yourself laboratories have been reported in Nature on March 2016. So these are among uh, you know, international publications and research that has been conducted by uh, Professor P. Um, uh, this afternoon, uh, he will be speaking about practices of community services learning in Universitas Gajah Mada. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please give uh, Professor Piambato a warmest welcome. Professor Piambato, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman. Uh, very good afternoon, everybody. Ladies uh, and gentlemen, uh, please uh, uh, permit me to share uh, my presentation, uh, which entitled Practices of Community Service Learning in Universitas Gajah Mada. In Universitas Gajah Mada, there's a very long history of community service started from uh, 1951, two years after the establishment of this university, where our student uh, and kids in uh, establishing secondary school in cities outside the main island of Java. 1,218 uh, students were involved and 109 secondary education. It means uh, high school, uh, high schools have been established uh, by those, uh, what we call a movement of uh, student, university student. Since then, we analyze the advantage and disadvantage of uh, student involvement in community service. And then uh, the result then make that Universitas Gajah Mada make a subject of uh, community service learning, a compulsory subject with three credit units from 1973. It mobilized four-year students to work with community, stay with the, in the community, overcoming, work with community to overcome the issue related to local problems. They should stay for two months in the community in a group consists of 20 to 30 students. And in that group should also consist students for from cluster, four cluster. We have four clusters, which is a, a, a cluster of physical infrastructure, consists of students from a faculty of engineering, faculty of science, and then a cluster of community health, 
we consist students from faculty of uh, uh, allied health, uh, medical, uh, faculty of pharmacy, faculty of dentistry, socioeconomic and culture cluster. We consist students from faculty of social sciences, political science, law, uh, literal, literature, economic and business is there, and agriculture related field such as faculty of agriculture, animal husbandry, fishery, um, uh, forestry is there, uh, agricultural technology also. The students should solve a real problem exists in the community that they are assigned to work and stay in. Oops. The community service learning objective is raise student empathy and care. We also want our students after graduation, they should know they will be the leader of the community, the leader of the country, the leader of the nation. And they should know who should they lead. They should know the people that they, were, uh, they are going to lead. And implementing science and technology in the field, increase the spirit of teamwork and multidisciplinary work. That is why they should come uh, with four clusters. Educating students as researchers, because they should apply this one according to the fact that they found in the field, not theoretical only. Training students to work collaboratively with various sectors, sectors, both fellow students as well as the uh, government officials there on the field, private sectors, NGOs, and community, and promote learning community and community empowerment. The what they should do on the field is that uh, they expected to work with research and survey, which is cannot be done by common people. For example, what the community have and what is the problem of the community, they should uh, look for that one through research and survey. And creating village data, a village data-based construction and science and technology application. Every year, Udiftas Gajamada should deploy 7,000 to 8,000 students in full every year from our 40,000 or more a student body. And we send them spread across 34 provinces in Indonesia, start from Aceh in the uh, northwest until Papua in the east, uh, southeast part of Indonesia. From Natuna on the north and Talaud in the north up to Rutindau in the south. Understanding that the involved with the community is not easy. It's not like uh, just uh, turning back our hand. So start from 2013, we change our strategy that student involvement in a certain area will be continuous so year by year. So it's not only coming for two months and then leave them, no. They should come in a certain place for two months, but it re repeated for several years. First, second, third, fourth, until fifth year. Every year, different group of students may involve, but the supervisor is same to uh, guarantee the, the continuation of the project. So the first year, maybe their, the student should do mapping on problem and capability of the, uh, uh, the community. Second year, they should discuss with the community what program and the target determination of each year. The year three, four, and five is the, uh, the year for program examination, uh, execution. Here are several uh, uh, examples of our project. Here's the project of uh, Kiri Chahyo providing uh, water. 
this village of Giri Cahyo in the southern part of Yogyakarta, 20, 35 kilometers away from our campus. In the dry season, the wa water for this village is depend on this small pond, which people use this pond for everything, from cooking, drinking, washing, they depend on this uh, uh, pond. On 2004, our student, a member of uh, Adventure Lover Club of the uh, university, going to that place and found a small cave, 107 in depth and only two meters in diameter. But the cave end in an underground river. We then examine the possibility of bringing water from this uh, underground river uh, to the uh, ground and then uh, calculate how many uh, inhabitants of the village, how many liters of water needed by each people, which means that how many liters of water or how many cubic meter of water should be provided uh, for that villagers. Upon uh, finding that uh, this is a possible project, then we continue. Students going to the uh, working in the cave under the underground done by student, especially the one who has uh, experience in caving. While upper ground on the ground uh, work done by community members, the people. We then bring water from the cave to the ground and from the ground to a hill which is uh, exists in the village, and then distribute water from the hill to seven villages, so seven hamlets. Government uh, provide us with pipe, while corporate provide us, assist us with pump and other uh, like uh, um, uh, solar panel. After five years of uh, effort, then in 2000, uh, 12, it, it was established, even uh, the organization for water management is also established and everybody have happy after five years of project. Another example of project has been done in Sataluk, where people uh, mine the coal, they use uh, mercury. As we know, mercury is very dangerous for the uh, environment as well as uh, for our health. We would like to change the way they mine the coal using alternative of mercury. But people always uh, insist that they are not mining the coal. When we send our students to that uh, community, they said that they have nothing with the uh, mercury. They are not good miners. Actually, they have the facility of mining uh, in the remote area up away from their home. But it's near to the uh, river, which is quite dangerous because the river go to a pond, a lake in the uh, Lombo, uh, Sumbawa Island. When we send our students, it needs sometimes the first week, none can be done because people always say that they are not gold miners. Second week. But I always suggest to the student, just keep contact with them, stay with them, play football, play volleyball, play badminton with them. On the third week, then people ask our student, do you want to see how to mine the gold? So it needs sometimes to get the people trust that we come to assist them, not to bother them. Upon getting this uh, information, we found that this uh, village suffer a lot because uh, some of the infant die when it delivered, during delivery. So we bring this result to university, asking professors and doctors to research, to do research on how to change or how to have an alternative way to mine the coal. After two years of effort, we found that 
uh, we can change the way to mine the gold using borax with the seeking table. So we bring this result to the community done by student. They are the one who is in front, in the very front for uh, frontier, uh, communicate, with, communicate with the community. And then later, a year later, people, local people, do with their own effort, following our way to, uh, to mine the code. So a collaboration, the understanding of university to the problem of our people is necessary. The third example is in Bojonokoro, where we found several cash mine uh, then people there think that at a certain time, they will go to the uh, mining company or cash company to become a worker in the mining industry, gas industry, a petroleum industry, which is not easy because the standard for uh, a worker in that uh, company uh, very, very high. Well, we found that those people has always, on uh, every household, they have thick wood, they have a banana, they have uh, many goat and also cattle. Then we would come to assist them to improve the livelihood through this, uh, uh, the asset that they have. We try uh, to have a breed between local goat with some napari, which grow faster and also, uh, also uh, try to find an alternative banana instead of the local banana, which is not, uh, the price is very low. The result were brought by a student explained to the community, working with the community after four years, then they were able to have a, a very good cage for the uh, uh, coop for the good and also is improve the livelihood of the people. During the pandemic era, we changed because the program, focus of program should be changed. We could not go to the field quite easy as before. So we changed the activity of students by making hand sanitizer, distributing um, uh, medicine and vitamins to the local people in the market with cheat, uh, teaching them about the virus, about the COVID pandemic, how to avoid wear mask, use a hand sanitizer uh, every time, everywhere. We also sometimes call the student to be a volunteer in giving vaccination, volunteer for checking the um, uh, uh, antigen or PCR. So we call, sometimes we need to call the student. Uh, combine, this is the method uh, combined from uh, online and offline. The online, when they, we teach them uh, how to do, we instruct them how to do, and at the same time, the student also uh, having an offline uh, activity uh, during the pandemic. Also the, the way to deliver uh, a change, before we have, uh, we can uh, how to have a, a direct communication face to face, but now we have to change uh, between the people in the village and the community with students from their own home uh, using the uh, internet or other online uh, uh, method. However, community still appreciate like here. And the current entity is a newspaper in the eastern part of uh, Nusa Tenggara. They appreciate that UGM uh, have or create a unique way to communicate with the people and then to teach them how to uh, improve the uh, small and mid, um, micro, small and medium businesses in the villages or in the community. Here also we prepare to have a um, uh, people to 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 to, to assist uh, others uh, through uh, uh, volunteer work, and here also the volunteer or the student may 
uh, assist people how to have a vaccination and teach them how important vaccination is. This is what we have done during the pandemic. Also, during the pandemic, the student disseminate online application created by the UGM to assist community in dealing with their daily problems. We have data apps which uh, can, uh, can be used by people in the village uh, whenever they have a problem with their uh, plant, their crop, their animal. Also, CTEC is a system information for um, uh, accountancy in the village. Also, during the pandemic, uh, students make a tutorial during they, they visit uh, their neighbor to assist them uh, because the student also, an uh, elementary student, may not be uh, able to go to the schools. Uh, but in some places, they even do not have an internet facility. So we use handy talkie instead of internet uh, to communicate, to assist the communication between uh, student and the uh, teachers. Even during this pandemic, we were able to make a detailed engineering design for building some facility in the village. This is from Kabupaten Bangga, which is far away uh, in different island from our main island in Jawa. But we have collected the data two, three years before this pandemic. So we, got, we collected the data from those places from 2018, 2019. And in 2020, we make uh, this uh, detailed engineering design by communication through internet or through uh, other uh, means of uh, communication. This is what uh, I could share with you about what uh, we have done in Universitas Gajah Mada and what we are going to do again and again, uh, communicating with the people through our students, uh, working with community service learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pak Irfan, for sharing uh, the activity of community services done by students in Universitas Gajah Mada. I believe that some participants uh, must have several questions, but then I need you to keep it first. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, the second presenter of this session will be uh, Ryan Sensei and Matsui Sensei from IT University of Education. He will be sharing about ideas on policy, management, and implementations of teacher practicum in Japan. Yet beforehand, allow me to read the short biography. Uh, Anthony Ryan has taught in Australia, China, and Japan. His teaching career started as a primary school teacher in Queensland, Australia, for five years before spending a year in Guizhou province in 1990 as an English instructor at a Chinese university. He then moved back to Australia to spend a year living with, living with and setting up schools for indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory of Australia. After moving to Nagoya, Japan in 1992, he started as an English instructor before moving into university teaching following distance learning studies for the master and PhD degrees. Having come from a long line of teachers in Australia with parents, grandparents and siblings who were and are teachers, his career now spans 36 years as a teacher. He has been teaching at IT University of Education for the past 20 years, and he is still learning something new every day about the profession. He has published on language learning styles, language learning strategies, domestic and overseas teacher practicum, CLIL, and interlanguage discourse analysis. And for uh, Takasiko Matsui, uh, he has been working at IT University of Education for seven years. Previously, he worked at junior and senior high schools for more than 20 years, where he enjoyed talking with students about comics and video games and enjoyed playing music in a band. His educational goal is to nurture autonomous individuals. When working at our attached schools, he tried to encourage students and students' teachers to develop the ability to think for themselves. At the university, as a technical teacher, is currently engaged in teaching students to enhance their practical educational abilities. Uh, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Masui 
you are given 30 minutes to share your topic. The floor is yours now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank Pak Didi and Pak Nunik for inviting me, uh, inviting us to uh, speak today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor uh, Pak Irfan for his speech just now. It was a very impressive community service program. Um, today, uh, our topic is policy management and implementation of teacher practicums in Japan. Um, I must apologize first. Uh, Matsui Sensei, uh, this exact time has coincided with an assessment of a graduate student's lessons at uh, a local school. So uh, this morning he uh, pre-recorded um, a short video of his part of the presentation, which I will play after my part. Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about the policy management and uh, Matsui Sensei will talk about the actual implementation um, the policy of uh, teacher practicum is, of course, set at the national level by the, the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. Uh, of course, the main requirement is for everyone who wants to become a teacher, they must be licensed. And there are three types of licenses that are issued to teachers uh, pre-service teachers before becoming teachers. They are normal certificates, which are valid for 10 years. And uh, they are, after 10 years, the teachers return to university for short 30 hour programs to um, let's say skill up in, or increase, get up to date with the latest research and knowledge in their field. And there's special certificates given to people outside of education. They might have a, a special skill in technology or sports or art. And then there's an extraordinary cert certificate, which is valid for three to five years, extended to those when individuals with a teacher's certificate are unavailable. Uh, in remote areas, there might not be um, language specialists or language teachers available, for example. So a local resident with skill in English language, for example, might be brought on to help at the school. Uh, in terms of getting a license in the ITE, in the initial teacher education, uh, the policy again is set by MEXT and if you want an elementary school license, it involves five weeks of teaching practice, junior high, five weeks, high school, three weeks, and special education, five weeks. That's relatively short if you compare that to, for example, Professor Ure Christina's talk yesterday. Australian education universities require up to 30 weeks of professional experience during their four years. Here in Japan, it's only five weeks. However, it is a very intense time, uh, a five week period or three week period. Additionally, uh, it is obligatory that seven days of experience of caring for those pursuing elementary and junior high school certificates. Now I'll explain that. Caring is what we would call close to your concept of community service. Um, however, if you can see there, um, caring in the first year students in the teacher training course have a two day experience, and then in the second year, a five day experience. Uh, and we have, for example, dispatched almost 1,500 students yearly to special support schools, nursing homes, homes for the deaf, um, daycare centers for the elderly, children's orphanages, and things like that. Um, of course, that's ob obli obligatory community service done by every student teacher 
in Japan. Uh, now, how is uh, the, there are three types of three strands to the teaching practicum here in Japan. Um, there's what is called school experience, professional experience, and what I just mentioned then, the caring community service. Uh, in first year, uh, the first years go out five times for three hours at a time to their alma mater elementary school, just to reintroduce themselves to the school environment. Uh, in the second year, they have another school experience um, where they attend for 13 times in a semester. And in the second year is also the, the second period of community service, uh, which is usually in the second semester. The third year, uh, com there's two semesters in the Japanese year, first year and second year. In the first year, they have a, in the first semester, they have a school experience number two, which is seven times, and it's only a morning at a school, seven times. And in the second semester, they do their first of their 15-day teaching practicum, three-week teaching practicums. In the fourth year, uh, in the first semester, they do the final two weeks of teaching practicum. So in fact, it's November, and we have just started our second semester of teaching at the university. The students have just come back uh, in all of October, most of October, from their teaching practice in the third years. So we start the semester after they return from teaching practice. They go to three types of schools what we call the attached, prefectural, and Nagoya municipal schools. Now, for some reason, ah, oh, yes. Okay, now this is Aichi Prefecture here in Japan. And uh, the, the city in purple there is the prefectural capital called Nagoya. They have their own board of education. And you have the prefecture wide in the pink, the yellow and the green, this is Aichi Prefecture. So this is the jurisdiction of the Aichi Prefectural Board of Education. Inside here, we have the Nagoya Board of Education. Aichi University also of Education also has seven attached schools, uh, a special needs school, uh, kindergarten, elementary schools, two elementary schools, and um, two junior high schools and a high school. Now, these are located in Nagoya, Okazaki, and AUE. AUE is Aichi University of Education. Uh, it's centered between Nagoya and Okazaki. Now, in terms of uh, management, um, how we do it at the school is the university selects the number of trainees that our attached schools can handle. So first we have um, attached schools that we send out, those seven schools that we send our teacher trainees to. This semester, uh, just in the October, I think there were 814 schools, 814 students dispatched to teacher training schools. Um, the vast majority went to our attached schools. Um, in step three, once the number is decided upon for each jurisdiction, the university sends a request to the Nagoya Municipal Board of Education or the, and the Aichi Prefectural Board of Education to ask for X number of places in the respective jurisdictions for student teacher places. Step four, each Board of Education then manages the next step differently, but Basically, each has a school rotation system in place. Uh, the Aichi Prefectural Board of Education is actually a cooperative comprised of six regional boards of education, each of which is comprised of their own town or city boards of education. So when a request comes from AUE to the Aichi Prefectural Board of Education, it 
filters down to the Board of Education with jurisdiction in the teacher trainee's hometown or to one as close as possible. We try to send our student teachers to schools in their hometown or in their area uh, that they grew up in. Here's an example from uh, Aichi Prefecture. Um, we sent 814 schools, students to 433 schools for this past three weeks. Uh, 224 of those went to our affiliated schools, attached schools. And then in the Aichi Prefectural Board of Education, there are six sub boards of education and you can see the numbers there. So there are a vast number of schools involved. Um, most schools take two, most of the Prefectural Board of Education schools and Nagoya City schools, Nagoya Municipal Board of Education schools take two or three uh, teaching practice students. Uh, um, whereas you can see our Nagoya Elementary School took 71. So some homeroom teachers have four or five prac students at the same time. It's a lot to handle. Uh, in terms of at the school and how the system is managed, uh, Professor Christina yesterday talked about a teaching fellow position they have just put in at uh, Victorian schools. Well, Japanese schools have had uh, this kind of hierarchy for a long time in terms of the organization of uh, school teaching practicums. Uh, at each school, you have a, t a chief of a teacher training program, and it's often the kyomu or the chief of curriculum at the school who for that period, seconds himself and gives himself a new job as the teacher trainer uh, coordinator. Then each subject at the school, for example, math has a subject chief, science, English, um, social studies has a subject chief. Uh, they are called leading teachers. And then of course, underneath that, you have homeroom teachers. The homeroom teachers themselves at the primary school level, they are the direct mentor teachers of the student teachers. But at junior high school and high school, it may or may not be a teacher of the same subject. And then at the fourth rank, we have the student teachers. And the university supervisor is actually outside this system. In fact, uh, the university supervisor, for example, myself, does not really have that much control over what happens on a school practicum in Japan. The university supervisor is uh, main job is to um, visit the school and to make sure we secure the links and the relationship between the school and the university and keep that secure. And of course, to visit the student teachers and to give them advice. How it works, the if you can see, uh, for an example, there might be four student teachers at a school, um, W son, X son, Y son, Z son. One of them is elected leader and liaises between the school and the university supervisor as an independent link. They'll contact me with the exact class times and things like that. Okay. Now, I'm going to uh, play share screen again if you don't mind um sorry uh, while i flick over to bear with me matsui sensei now is going to talk about the uh implementation matsui sensei is uniquely placed he was a student, a mentor teacher for many years. And now he is part of our staff at the university. So on the other side, so he has a very unique perspective from both. So I'd just like to share and play his video. Hopefully, please let me know 
if uh, you cannot um, if you cannot hear it uh... thank you professor ryan i am takahiko matsui and i'll talk about the third section of our presentation the implementation of teaching practicums from the perspective of the student teachers and mentor teachers. I'm currently working at Aichi University of Education, but I used to be a teacher at a junior high school. When I was an English teacher at Nagoya Junior High School, I accepted and supervised many students for the educational training. Currently, I'm engaged in teaching training at a university, and I think that the practical management and administration for the teaching practicum at the attached school makes a lot of sense. Therefore, I'd like to report on the actual teaching guidance at the attached school. First of all, each school that accepts student teachers sets its own aims for it. Then, we, I mean the mentor teachers, guide the student teachers in order to achieve those aims. At Nagoya Junior High School, the aims of teaching practicum are set in this way. In order to achieve these aims, we mentor teachers ask students' teachers to do the following things. During the practicum, mentor teachers ask the student teachers to behave like members of society. Also, since student teachers rarely have opportunities to interact with junior high school students, we mentor teachers ask them to respect junior high students and to have many opportunities to contact with them. We don't worry too much about whether they have qualities as teachers or not at the beginning of the practicum. As for mentor teachers, we have many opportunities to discuss the cases and try to elicit students' teachers' ideas. This is because learning from the case studies including the preceding and following context, it's something that can only be done during the teaching practicum. I taught student teachers with special emphasis on student guidance and subject guidance. I would tell them, always check to see how the students respond to your words. This can only be confirmed during practice. And when you learn new theories at the university after this practicum, always think how the students react. You should observe the students carefully in order to be able to do that. Next, I'd like to report on the curriculum to achieve our aims. In Aichi and Nagoya, we have one day of briefing sessions and three weeks of the teaching practicum. Please take a few moments to look through this table, these tables.
First, we have briefing sessions to give students teachers an opportunity to prepare. We have them come to school approximately three weeks before the practicum and participate in the lecture session, classroom observation, and prior meetings. In the lecture, we first teach them how to read a lesson plan and then how to observe the classes and the students. After the lecture, the student teachers observe the class. They record the teacher's speech and actions in each scene of the class. They also carefully record how the students react to the teacher's speech and how they behave. After observing the class, they discuss with the subject supervisors the meaning of the speech utterances in each situation and what the students were doing at that time. Through this instruction, we let the students teachers learn what to keep in mind when constructing a class. In the meeting with the homeroom teachers of the class to which the student teachers belong, we check the classroom management policy and work as a homeroom teacher. We also check the names of the students in the class. At last, we decide on the schedule and content of the moral education class that the students would be teaching. As a subject supervisor, I told the student teachers to prepare some parts of their lesson plan and send it to me via email before the practicum began. Specifically, I told them to write the unit observation section and learning context and learning method of the unit sections after researching the teaching materials. They could write those sections even before interacting with junior high school students. This was because they could have more time to interact with junior high school students if they finish writing them during the practicum. About three weeks after the briefing sessions, the three-week training practicum will take place. The main activities of the student teachers for each week are shown in the table. I will report the specific contents of the activities later. Note that observation means observing a class. Participation means being involved in a part of the class as a teacher. And practice means conducting classes by themselves. You see the term between the desk's guidance. When students are working on exercises or trying to work out problems in class, teachers walk around in the classroom and check the students' notes. If they find students in trouble, they give the students advice and guidance. This is called between the desks guidance. In addition, they will conduct one research lesson each in moral education and the subject. The research class is positioned as a class for students to show the results of their practical training. For this reason, many teachers at the school and university supervisors observe the class and hold uh, review sessions after the class. Through the sessions, students summarize their own practice. This is a typical daily schedule of student teachers on practicum. I will explain some specific activities in observation, participation, and practice later. Please take a few moments to look through this table.
and this is the typical daily schedule of mentor teachers on practicum. In addition to the regular duties, they observe student teachers and provide guidance during the reflection time. Please take a few moments to look through this table. Now, I will explain the specific activities of student teachers during each week. On the first day of the practicum, students listen to many teachers about school affairs. By listening to the principal, vice principal, head of the instruction department, and other teachers about their roles, students learn about the overall structure of school education and the school management. From the second day on, observation and participation are the main activities for them. The goal of observation in week one is to understand the structure of the class and the reality of student learning. Student teachers learn about the structure of the class by observing and recording the type of activities order of the activities, time spent on each activity, teacher's speech utterance in activities, and so on. They also observe the students and find out their strengths, weaknesses, and so on. They will then apply these lessons to their own classes. Through the participation in week one, student teacher have experience of teaching as a teacher. For example, in an English lesson, student teachers will take the place of their supervisors in some of the class activities, such as reading the textbook aloud and checking the meaning of the vocabulary. It is also important to understand the reality of the students through between the desk guidance. They will then apply these experiences to the classes they conduct. From week two, in addition to observation and participation, practice begins. Furthermore, most student teachers have a research lesson of moral education. All of them have only one lesson in moral education, and that lesson will be the research lesson. The goal of observation in week two is to understand the importance of teacher's speech and utterances. Student teachers record the speech and utterance of their subject supervisors. They also record the students' responses to the speech. From these records, they learn that using simple words and speaking slowly with frequent pauses facilitates students learning. They will then apply these lessons to their own classes. The aim of participation in week two is the same as the one in week one. I had student studies practice and conduct all the parts of the class before their practice lessons started because I wanted to give them the confidence that they could conduct the entire class by themselves. The goal of practice and research lesson is to develop their practical teaching skills. Student teachers teach the class. After the class, they and their mentor teachers discuss it from the points you see on the screen. Through this discussion, student teachers will improve their practical teaching skills. Week three is the last week of the practicum. 
student teachers observe the practice lessons of their peers and critically review them. They give between the desk guidance to the students and develop their teaching skills. In practice and research lesson, they teach the classes and review them after. Then, on the last day, they listen to lectures from their mentor teachers. After the practicum, they reflect on what they did during the practicum and submit the practicum folio to the homeroom teacher within a week of the end of the practicum. Homeroom teachers comment on their reflections in a positive way. And for student teachers with low ratings, homeroom teachers inform them again of the points they need to work on. The mentor teachers evaluate the students' learning based on the items and the points. At Nagoya Junior High School, two teachers supervise one student teacher. After the practicum, these two mentor teachers will evaluate one student teacher. Mentor teachers give an A, B, or C, but there is also a D. The D means that the student teacher is rejected. When I was working at Nagoya Junior High School as a mentor teacher, I focused my energies and strengths on these points. We mentor teachers always try to develop talented teachers that will forge the future of Japan. Thank you. And uh, here you can see some pictures uh, Matsui Sensei talked about the briefing sessions held at university beforehand. The briefing sessions are, supervised, are implemented by expert teachers that we have identified in the community, and we invite them into the university to take one day of lessons, one, uh, one day of skills practice for junior high school, and another day for elementary school. The top we can see uh, here, junior high school, down the bottom is elementary school. They're reading the book, uh, Animal Farm. Then on practice, you can see a couple of photos there of student teachers at schools. Oops, sorry. And one thing about Japan is uh, teachers are very used to being observed by other teachers. You can see here in a, lesson here, there are one, two, three, four, five, there's the student teacher, six others observing this teacher. And in the same in the side, they're very used to being observed by other teachers and by student teachers. And even in their in service, when they become professional teachers, twice a year, in first semester and in second semester, they give open lessons and are observed by local teachers in the area. Okay. Jeez, I'm not having much luck. Thank you for listening. Uh, any questions, please send to 
Ryan or Matsui at Aichi University of Education. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Matsui for sharing with us. I, might be, I suppose that there are some similarities on how we prepare student teacher in terms of the practicum at the schools. Probably later we will have a more you know, a fruitful discussion after all the presenters uh, present their topic. Uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen, the next presenter of the session is Professor Kuo Ping Lin. Allow me to read briefly on uh, his biography. So Professor Kuo Ping Lin is a professor and chairman of the Department of Industrial Engineering and Enterprise Information, Tunghai University, Taiwan. He's also the recipient of multiple awards from TIIM, MOST, MOE, and ORSTW. He's senior members of senior member of I, uh, EEE, members of ORSTW, CMA, and CIIE. He's also the board member of Asia Pacific Region International Foundation for Production Research, Deputy Secretary General of China's Institute of Industrial Engineers. His associated, associated editor, expert system with applications, guest editor for Journal of Imaging Science and, and Technology, editor board for forecasting, and he has for sure authored or co-authored over 20 papers in international journals and conferences. Today, his presentation is about industrial engineering and enterprise management in Industry 4.0 era. Professor Kuo Ping Lin, would you please take the floor? Okay. Okay, thank you. So everybody can hear my thoughts, okay? So I check my... Yes. My PowerPoint, okay. I share my PowerPoint. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, so everybody can see my how my point pointer. Yes, very clear. Okay, okay, okay. So thank you, all the chair and uh, and uh, uh, introduce me. Okay, so I come from the industry engineer engineering and uh, enterprise management, and uh, now I am service and the professor and the chairman in this department. Okay, so. In, in this time, I want to share that everybody knows my, our department how to train in our the students because this, this topic is industry, industry, industry training, okay? So I want to, want to everybody knows how, how to, in Donghai University, we can, uh, we can train our students and uh, cooperation with our the industry. Okay, so the first this is a thank you. So our our chair have the introduced the some so I can skip the this this slide. Okay, so and I also promote my journal. Okay, so it's WA. Okay, it's comfort. It's also your journal, and I will come to everybody to to submit some of the paper to our the journal. And the, another is MTPI, the topics is for our the decision, decision makings, okay. So maybe have the, some of the decision making the issue and the, our the uh, assistance issues and the welcome to submit our my journals, okay. So this is just only promote, okay. At the first, I want to let everybody know what is the industrial engineering because all the department is industrial engineering. Okay, so uh, I also will let our students know because we have the some the skills in our the, in our the course. So course and skill, I want to link the, the two the two issues. And the, so it, everybody, you can see the first class. Okay, it's all the we have the skill is production and the operations training. See, it's the first is our out skill, and uh, we want to have all the students know the international production and the operation the major. Okay, so 
And the third is the materials the handling. And the fourth is the logistic and the operations scheduling. So if our students want to learn in the, the four skills, how to learn this? Okay. And the list of this class you master. Uh, we must first let our students have the objective and the motivations because so the first year I also we have the one the best best concept of the all the industrial engineering so we will design the, the first year let everybody knows what's the industrial engineering okay and uh, so I let our the let our the our the Oh, let, 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 let everybody know what's the industrial engineering here. Okay, so wait a minute. So, so everybody will know the other department is for cooperation with industry. Professor Koping, are you still in the room, right? Lights mute, muted? Uh, I don't think so. Professor Koping, can okay. you? So you can see. No, it's still on the slide of what is industrial engineering. Okay. It doesn't move anywhere. Okay, so I turn back. I okay. Okay, so if everybody knows now the industrial engineering, and uh, also we must train all the students to want to know, let's let, let them to know the industry 4.0 because all the codes will, will link to our the 4.0. And so we can see because in our the department, uh, I want to all the students, uh, the first uh, lean production, he must know what's the lean production and the uh, intelligent manufacturing. So we must uh, design all the codes. Okay, the first is the production management. Okay, so we designed all the cost production management and the operation research and the supply chain the management and the AI algorithms and the internet of things. This this course is the I we will we will design to the first year to and to layer the fourth year. And the data analysis is very important, and the quality the management, and the, and the, in all the cloud systems. So, in the list course, okay, we want to let all the students know this. And so we, all the teachers, must train in, okay, must train. In, so we have the some the software. We will assign our the our the teacher the facility to train to learn in about uh, in the industry how to implement uh, this uh, with maybe program software and how to use it and uh, let our the teachers to train our the students okay so this is a very key point in our the Donghai University and uh, here here is very very important so uh, I think uh, maybe everybody, uh, you didn't know our Doha University locations and uh, we we are in all the locations in the uh, center of Taiwan. Okay, because this is our map, our Google maps. So in here, okay, in here, 
here is all the Donghai University here. And uh, so near all the companies, the first uh, is the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing System companies. And uh, all the AUO, okay, all the AUO objective and the uh, hospital. This is the very big hospital in center, in center of Taiwan. And the uh, and, uh, light, light gates, okay. So this, this all the companies is all the corporations companies. So all the students will the three year, the, the third, the third year and the fourth year, the third year have the project cooperation with the least industry. Okay, these companies and the, the four the fourth year, they will have the chance to intern in these companies. So we must we must let all the costs very close industry. Okay, so maybe the the following will introduce the our the our the course how to design the our the course and let us train in the our students. Okay, so I, I think everybody knows what's the TSMC. Do you know this the companies? Have, have there any no? Okay, so maybe I introduce some of TSMC because this is the high technology TSMC. So we have the many codes where let a let our students to to learn in TSMC. Let let's the pre let's let's the uh let's dump so let's give that okay. So can see the list this, this the movie? No. Hey, no. How about this? No, it's still the same. No, side. no. Okay, so wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So maybe I use the share, share, share my old screen. I, I think maybe I, I share the whole screen. Wait a minute, okay. Okay. Okay, let's see the movies. We couldn't hear anything. Did you share uh, out here too when you okay. heard the slide, the video? Okay. So 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 now you can see the movies. Okay. Because TSMC yeah. is very close to our Dongha University. Hmm. So we have all one course is semi semiconductor manufacturing process because we must focus on all the all the students graduate in may they will maybe maybe work in our the TSMC. We, we don't okay. hear anything. Okay. okay, wait a minute. Okay. So we let let's let's move it just only let everybody knows about uh what's the TSMC and uh, because all the codes will 
for your many uh, our other course some of the subject is for TSMC because our the course will for TSMC AUO and our the hospital okay because uh, I will introduce about because now we have the main the new technologies okay so we can use the deep learning and the uh, Navidas okay Navidas is our the GPU so because new technology we also must let out our the teacher to learn about this knowledge and uh, teaching our the students okay so we also many one year or two year will we will uh, change the, our the our the book and the, our the material for students okay so because you know because our the our very close to the our the science science zone so we have the many companies they will give it all the new technologies so we can change it all the all the course okay so we must change it okay so uh, i introduce about how the how we have the undergrad program and the master grade, master program and the phd program and the and the another we have the in service program master program in service master program in service master program is for AI hospital. Okay, so I introduced the list of course that everybody knows because all the course will how to train in our students. Okay, and the, how to cooperations with the, all the companies. Okay, so the first is we have the, the best first testing and we have the design data analysis and the production management, quality management and the manufacturing process. This is the course is for big data and uh, our the intelligence 4.0 manufacturing and the uh, hospital. Okay, so we 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 divide three parts okay to introduce about our the course. And the first uh, you can see the sub via for data analysis course. Okay, so we have the use the system via. Okay, so why we chose the sales buyer? Because in TSMC, in AUO, in our the, some the some the shopping mall, okay, they use the SaaS via to analysis. They they uh, they improvement and the real use the SaaS via. So we must let our students understand what's the SaaS via. Okay, so we must train in this SaaS via. So I remember we, uh, we implemented this SAS via the first year. We assigned uh, about four, four facilities to, to learn about what's the SAS via. Okay, so in, in Taiwan, we, we want to let out the facility, out the teachers know new technology. And, uh, let, and the least technology is for industry. And uh, I train in the, my suit, my teachers let let know industry in industry they really, really use the skill. Okay, so this is very important because our students were graded and want to let all the in all the com companies hire. He must understand this skill. Okay, so in in Taiwan, our Dong University, I use the list so. I think uh, maybe SaaS via is the is a very big companies. Okay, SaaS. I think statistic and analysis is SaaS. So uh, I, I think everybody I think everybody knows about what's the SaaS via. Okay, it's the analysis of the where and for maybe AI for for AI analysis and the deep learning analysis and the, some some. Uh, the best statistic, such via also can help uh, our analysis. Okay, so all the course will do. So in order, in all the course, we have the data analysis course will introduce the real, real case. Okay, this like this big data case studies, data mining, logistics the emphasis. Because our students, we must let them know what's the objective. So do, do this uh, big data analysis, they want to know logistic emphasis. 
Okay, so we were very clear layer the objective. Okay, in all the students, like in this case, this is the Uber. He want to know what's demand. Okay, you must know machine learning algorithms. They, they you can use the SAS via to do machine learning algorithms. And the, but you want to analysis what's your the what's you want to analysis goal is demand. Okay, so. We will teach it our students, and uh, so all the all the teachers have the training. Okay, have the training and uh, to to teach it our students, and uh, like this Netflix. So he must know how in Netflix you must create the the data and uh, let our students understand uh, uh, how to use the SAS via to do data fix layer how to analysis the blank slide. Like this, the playback star rating given the blah, blah, blah. It's a many, many the fields and the what's the resource you want to, we want to analyze this, okay? And the data driven the like the base, okay? So uh, the first, the three years of the students, the three years they have the project, okay? They have the project. How the list of course big data analysis is, is a, we assignment in our the two, the, the second year, okay, the second year to learn in this and the, the third year to do project in here, okay. So we we let our students so data driven the business so like like the second year he can learn in about a uh, list of skill and uh, how to how to implement how to apply the, this. Data this this SAS via the platform and uh, and uh, use the learning about the first case and uh, the third year they can do some play the project, okay. And uh, this is another case and I just only shows to let everybody knows okay. So like the PNG PNG the case so students in the third the second year they can learn in about this okay. So list all the some of the circles is maintain developer, money manager, and update. This is our the principle. This this is that our students can understand. Okay. So the second is the manufacturing. Okay. So we 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 just introduce have the three three part is the analysis and the manufacturing. Okay. So manufacturing have the many the companies use the manufacturing skill. Okay. So this is the struggle. Okay. This struggle we can we can show because we want to let our students understand. So in this struggle, we can see in the first in here, the green, okay, the green the background, you can see this is the digital. Okay. So the first, uh, the second year, sorry, so the second year, all the students were learning about what's the IoT, Internet of Things. Okay, because the third year, they want, they want to do some of the project with all the companies. The second year, he must know what's the IoT, because all the, all the data comes from the Internet of Things. Okay, so, so everybody can see this. The first, the background, the, the background green, green colors is the IoT. And the, the up level, the up level, we can see the, the broad ground, okay, broad background, the colors is the SCN, CRM, ERP. Okay, so and the enterprise, the resource, the premium. Okay, so this course we will design to the third years. Okay, because you want to create data and you want to analysis and apply, apply to other companies, the real platform in ERP as supply chain and the customer research and management. You must let our students the third year. Okay, so, so, so the third year we have the, maybe have the production management course and all the production, uh, production uh, production management and our quality management, okay, and uh, our some 
uh, quality production and the supply chain. We have we will design to the third year. Okay, the third year to learn about this course. And, and so the second year in here and the, the third year in the third year we're learning about how to use the implement list and the, they will do project okay for this course. And the, this this course we also will assign the one mental. Okay, this mental comes from the industry. Okay, not all the all the facility. So we have the one mental is come from industry. Okay, so this project will help help this mental is to help our students what's the real in, in that in their the companies, how to use the list skill. So our students will very interested about these issues because uh, I know I graduated in here, I can learn the list skill and the, uh, I have the, some the mentors from the industry. So maybe I graduated from we, we can work in all the mental men companies. Okay, so the third year we designed the list. And then also we have the many, some the important and the key skill course in the third year. Okay, so, and the, the third year, remember our students must do project in here. Okay. So this is another case because manufacturing industry 4.0 step is very, very famous. Okay. So ERP systems is the real system is step. Okay. And the uh, ERP also have in Taiwan, we have steps, Oracle. Oracle have the, some like, uh, like they have a business suit. Okay. They also play is, is they implement our the ERP system. So in the, our the production management, Production management, this course, we also teach you about what's the step, that's their skill and the list of the wear. Okay. And uh, in up level in here, you can see in step, we have the production quality, reliability, and the machine learning, and the machine learning skill, and the some the process control capacity. Okay. And the equipment maintains. Okay. So uh, a factory the monitor are in good management that, that dashboard this. So how students were learning about this? Okay, this all in layer the third years. Okay. So in here, many manufacturing level, this analysis maybe in their master program. Okay, like AI people learning and the best uh, a process control will design to our the master program. Okay, because you want to deeply investigate and study layer the many researches and the cooperation with all the companies. Okay, the third year you can do some project, but in in here you can see the list this topic. This topic is our the research topic. So in master program, we are we all the students will also join the other uh, com companies, the mentors, and the to do layer the master program, that master series. Okay. So in here, there is also we'll do some of the other skill, how the master program will do this. Okay. AI machine learning, edge, edge the, and the survey and census analysis. So here is my other, how my department designed all the design system framework. Okay, this is, comes from the old students, not all the teachers. This is, comes from the old students. So all students have to can do this from the device and to do control and to get away and scale up. Okay, because uh, this IoT the training though from the old the, the second year. From the second year to the third year, and uh, he will do this project. Okay, so I I show this project for 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 everybody knows this pro this is our students' project, and then we come come we cooperation with the pay card reader. This is the one companies.
Yeah, there is no audio for this video, Prof. Kuopin. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this just only everybody knows about uh, all, the, all the course, how to train all the students. And uh, this is our student project. Okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, so I think we'll introduce the, the final the pass is our the master program. Okay, we also have the master program in service department master program in AI in hospital. And then we have the some the it goes you you know our nearest have the central hospital in our Donghai University just only close to one road, okay is the central hospital. So we have the many students come from the medicine department and the nurse, okay. So we have the also do some the cooperation with the our the our the central hospital because we have the industry can corporations and uh, we can uh, do some of the project and uh, do some of the do some of the meetings and the cooperation meetings with the all the central all the central the hospital and uh, so we have to also have the course about about how to train our students understand their the hospital and the skills okay so this is the dialysis 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 Diseases and the development drugs the first is because use the AI we can achieve the all the list goals okay so this is just only shows about how the maybe we can do some of the project and the, all the 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 third years of the students also can do this as the project I think maybe in the our department we have the uh, uh, about twenty percent students they do project about med about these issues, okay? Because maybe in the futures they will graduate in our the department. They also can do work, do work work in our the med our the hospital, okay? So we also have to do this course with cooperation with cooperation with the our the some of the project and uh, to do this medicine issues, okay? So this just only shows everybody knows, maybe we have the, some, some skills we want to let our students know. And uh, this is machine learning. So we can do data analysis, machine learning, AI. Now we have teaching all students, let everybody know. And uh, because in all the companies industry, this is very important, okay? Because all the corporations companies also is high technologies. And then maybe DNA is some of the analysis we can do this. Because in here, some of the Watson, Watson, Watson stops away, Watson spread home. If if all the hospital will do this to implement some of the platform, we also will let all the teachers will we're learning about this skill and uh, teaching our students. Okay, so this is just only a brief uh, shows how, how to training and uh, maybe some of the first year all the intern, all the students will first let everybody, any students uh, learning about their skill and uh, let this skill and uh, implement to all the companies. So, our the course will use the our current our the industry use the in platform and the software and uh, we teach this and uh, let our students and uh, join the some one mentors from the company but and let our students can understand or what's the software what's the implement that can let credit let credit and uh, to do work in their companies. Okay, so thank you very much. This is this picture is all the in all the is in all the campus. Okay, so we all the campus also have the very famous in all the Lucy the church. Okay, this have the uh, many famous in all the Taichung. Okay, so I think okay. So I think this. 
Okay, so I think this is my presentation. So maybe have the have the have the questions. Yeah, thank okay. you very much, Professor Kuo Ping Li. Okay. Thanks for your wonderful ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems that yeah, industrial technology is very rapidly increasing and 4.0 era requires students, people to be, you know, really uh, knows the way how technology and industry yeah. need to, you know, win all the opportunity that is available yeah. in the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for you to uh, to ask questions, give comments, or you know, sharing your experiences uh, to the room. If you have questions and you want to share it directly, you could raise your hand. And but beforehand, I think we have one question in the chat room here. From uh, I think this question is applicable to be responded and addressed by all the speakers here. Uh, Ibu Martini mentioned, this is from SM Negeri Sedayu. She mentions that it is very difficult for online learning. She especially experienced also a, connect, a, a connection issue during joining our webinar. Uh, also, uh, she has it in teaching and learning processes. So how teachers, can facilitate students in online learning when many students face the problem, the connection issue, low facility in learning because of the, you know, economical background. Is there any mm -hmm. idea what uh, you could share to us, uh, Prof. Irfan, uh, Prof. Uh, Tony, or Prof. Koping? Oh. Hey. Yeah. So, Tom. Hello. Okay. 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 So we, we will be starting from uh, Ryan Sensei. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, it's an actually quite a very difficult question that. Um, in Japan, what happened was when the COVID um, pandemic struck and schools were closed down for the first five or six weeks, um, everything went online and what happened was the prefectural boards of education and the schools. Of course, Japan is economically uh, viable. They were able to um, make sure that each child had access to some mobile devices. And the connections, internet connections here aren't that bad. So there were tablets that schools were able to provide to students who did not have the facilities at home. Um, now, of course, I understand that is, you know, not the case in many countries where uh, remote areas, especially. And as the, as the questioner said, uh, very common problem that um, there's not enough internet power. Mm -hmm. However, uh, some teachers were quite innovative and um, they put lessons online as YouTube, uh, YouTube videos. Um, some of my former students who are now teachers became web teachers, if you like, and uh, they would post out via email worksheets and they would post the videos of the lessons uh, onto the YouTube. And in that way, students could download and look at them when their connections were, were strong, if you know what I mean. And they had received the materials, worksheets and questionnaires by a post or email. Uh, so that is um, perhaps, you know, YouTube, uh, I think we should take advantage of many, as many um technological advances and applications as we can so uh there are some very good ones out there and i think youtube just can't be beaten at the moment for teachers being able to produce their own material put it up there and have students download and access it in their own time uh yeah and of course use the traditional postage method or email to send the students um worksheets and things like that sorry thank you thank you prof ryan okay. uh, prof. do you have some other 
you know perspective to share okay I in addition to in okay. addition to uh professor ryan uh session is sending the uh materials first and then the uh also uh, recorded um uh, Hershey, uh explanation but uh, the students should receive first the materials uh, they can print it that is first second uh, we also have experience on that that uh, also some students living in the nearby neighborhood can start to have like a, a small classes uh, we use our student when they have to do with the community service learning during the pandemic so you stay at home you stay mm -hmm. at your uh, community you do not have to go everywhere but gather with the student in a certain place of course with the distancing physical distancing so explain that one that second third also we have experience with a very remote area in Bujonokoro. i think that you know even uh, that the Bujonokoro, the, the connection the internet connection is uh, uh, not as good as in Yogyakarta. and then we suggest them to use so the materials distributed to the student and then ask a, a answer and question are done by handy talking which is a more more, more powerful to the uh, internet because of the uh, short wave uh, con connection so that is what uh, uh, this difficulty in pandemic make us more creative in making uh, a way to deliver uh, our uh, target or, or, or method of uh, delivery thank you thank you prof irfan um, this is might be really interesting too to invite professor Kuo Ping Li mm, because yeah. you're also talking about industry 4.0 it's technology yeah. and if you know this issue occur how would you suggest us okay so in taiwan now we have the sound course is the uh, e-learning and uh, online okay but i i think uh, we have the uh, one quite one one challenge is, is about how to evaluate the our students okay because we have the, the standard in Francis because uh, we use the, all the online course or the e-learning to train our students uh, evaluate also is our the very big challenges okay okay so because uh, we have to do some in our Doha University we do some of the platform okay we we can uh, we can let our students uh, to, if we education, you will give some of the uh, teachings, during the teachings, we can, we can give some of the questions about our students and uh, let let to do some uh, updates out, let maybe A, B, C, D, and do some of the subject, let that to answers. And uh, so we use the list uh, to use the list uh, these skills let our students can understand. Uh, we want to promote and the evaluate our students. So I think e-learning and online list of course, maybe in the future it's it because COVID-19 and uh, maybe in the future this is, uh, we will meet, maybe all the students will, uh, maybe in the future they will uh, they were learning at home and uh, maybe they learning at uh, everywhere. Okay. So I think uh, in all the university, we have to do some of the perfect form. And uh, uh, I think just only this is the, uh, the best. Maybe in the future as well, we'll promote all the platform. Okay. This, I think maybe in the future, so everybody will meet a list of questions. Thank you, Professor Kuping. It seems that the pandemic forces us to be more innovative and creative in order you know, to run the teaching and learning processes and yeah. also our community services uh, you know, uh, still relevant to the target aimed before the pandemic arrived. Uh, Papa Ipu, you, do you still have some questions you could just directly address to our uh, speakers here? 
or you could also type it here. Uh, while waiting for uh, the questions given by the participants, I'm going to, you know, a little bit addressing the questions to Prof. Irfan. It seems that, you know, in, in the community services conducted in Gajah Mada University, there is a sustainable way of, you know, uh, uh, organizing the project done by students in the society. This will lead to more than a year, right? So how, you, how do you usually manage the, you know, uh, the communications among the batch of, of the community service team from uh, year one to year two, because year one has not finished doing the research and observation, but then they have to finish it and the outcome targeted has not achieved yet, but suddenly you just need to stop because the duration has you know, ended. How, how do you make sure that the transfer of information and communications to the society uh, does not start from you know, the beginning, you know, building trust from the first time? Yeah. First year, the, the group of the first year group should first mean, uh, um, create a communication with the community. So this two months for them, they do, they stay, uh, we are not asking them to do anything except for trust building. So trust building with the community, especially with the youngster. Because uh, uh, we, we, I think I will not be, uh, rely on the uh, elder because uh, uh, they may be reluctant for changes. Especially when our student come, the student come, they're young, very young. Uh, the older might be uh, reluctant to change. But with the youngster, the same age, communicate with them is easier first. The youngster in the community will have uh, like a, a, a improving their proud. I have a friend from university. I have a friend from uh, UGM. Yeah. This is the first group duty. Once they build this one, usually they will bring go home uh, their friendship. There's still communicate, uh, a communication between them. And then also the supervisor should uh, involve in that uh, communication. When they change, uh, from the first group to the second group, the second year group. Then the second year group usually uh, look for the info, such information from the group before. And the group before, for example, the group in 2018, after finish or completed the duty, usually they start to, uh, to look for who are going to uh, continue their project in such area. And we also, in this university, in the directorate for uh, uh, community service, will announce that you can access the data of those uh, community. So we will provide them with the data that uh, collected by the uh, the first group, the group. The, the professor or the supervisor also say same, the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, for continuation, because he is the one who know uh, the proper be is the one to know uh, on the leader of the group. So this is how we continue, uh, we connect each year group with uh, another year group. Thank you, Prof. Irfan. Um, Vaipu, do you have questions? Or sharing your experience for teaching, organizing, um, practicum during this pandemic. We still have um, more or less eight minutes left, seven minutes left. Perhaps can I ask a question? Yeah. Sure, you <laughs> can. <laughs> of the Indonesian teacher trainers there, uh, how closely is the university supervisor involved in teaching practicum in the school? Do they have much 
uh, control over what the student does in the school or is the school mainly the main provider of uh, advice and requirements for teaching practicum? Oh, that's an interesting question. Probably we, we have some teachers here, lectures observing the... Yes, that's the what I'd like, to, I'd like to hear from. Us. <laughs> Probably Prof. Tony will also share about what, what happened, how you organize the practicum in Japan during the pandemic. Well, during the pandemic, um, it was quite interesting. The student teachers could attend the schools. However, outside visitors, for example, university supervisors could not. So last year, this year, the numbers have dropped, so we were able to go and visit our student teachers in October and June, for example. However, last year, for the whole year, we were not able to. However, the student teachers themselves could enter the school. Uh, there are very strict pandemic measures being taken in Japan. For example, wearing masks, of course, is actually nationally, let's say it's a habit, and it has been for many years when someone was sick, automatically they put a mask on. So suddenly you had the whole country in masks and it's still, they still are. And it's, so it wasn't very hard to train the Japanese population and the students as well. So students now in schools are wearing masks, teachers are all wearing masks and the student teachers and the supervisors were able to visit this year. Last year, as I said, only the student teachers could visit. So we could only rely on what the school said about the student teachers. Yeah, in Indonesia, I suppose that the preparations for a student teacher uh, before they enter, you know, the teaching practices with the students at a, at a level, elementary, secondary or high school. So it's all conducted online by using Zoom or Google Meet. So then, because basically all schools were, you know, we're not on, we, we didn't do the activity face-to-face. Um, um, uh, -face. It's just suddenly mm. that some schools have started to have face-to-face. -face. So when it's, uh, you know, allowed by the government, then some student teachers start to, start to go to the school. Then the mm. observation from the mentor from the university will be just you know, uh, still facilitated by the technology, you know, you know meeting daily, weekly basis. Yeah. yeah. Still, it, it is still ongoing at this moment. So uh, uh, the, the changing for, you know, direct observation by mentor to school might be also happening. So we're still, you know, uh, mm. trying to see the opportunity. But for now, everything is just, you know, observation and mentoring yes online. it's a very been a very steep learning curve in yes. terms of technology uh, we've all learned so much in this past couple of years uh, but let's all pray for better times ahead when we can go back to face to face and actual real quality contact with the students yeah lots of new thing will be will be you know adapted and we should exactly. uh, changing and we'll be better because we'll have we'll be able to use technology in the classrooms more than we used to uh, in the face to face as well. So, yeah, mm. yep. This, this is very interesting because some students also mentions that they are now used to have this. It's you know their daily life activities having online learning. So when everything is starting to to be normal now, it's like a hard thing to move. Uh, their body from in front of their devices and go to school. It's yeah, some found this interesting fact. They don't want to go back to school. Some of the teachers as well. <laughs> yeah. Some of them. Right. Your professor and Pak Irfan also do the same thing. Yeah. Reluctant for you to go to the uni. Professor yeah. Goping, do you have any experiences? How will you organize things there during this pandemic? Okay, so uh, 
in in Taiwan or in Taiwan. Okay, so we have we have to do some like uh uh because because in Taiwan now we have the some the okay, face to face the all the all the students now. Okay, so so this this is just because we have to like uh like 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 afternoon we have the class okay so we can use the face to face to let our students to to learn in about this so but I I think I think uh but uh, overall uh, and I also will feel this think this is very difficult to also is the estimate and the, our, our our students because face to face is the Maybe it's is very clear and let our students and the, all the mentors, or we have the also have the communist mentors. They can they can all help out the instrument. This the project will successful, and uh, so we uh, we divide about forty percent forty percent from the mentors average and. Uh, 60% is our teachers. Uh, our teachers will face to face to to discussion our students and uh, mentors maybe now because uh all the COVID-19 we have some use the virtuals, use the web to discussions. Okay. So we have to do the list to pass uh from the other mentors and from the all the all the teachers to discussion about we have uh, uh, our total the scores will let let our students use the sixty percent and the forty percent to do this. Okay. Thank you, Professor Kuping. Uh, Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen, apparently this brings to our end of this plenary sessions. Uh, let's uh, give a virtual applause for our uh, three speakers in this room. Thank you very much, Professor Irfan, Professor Tony, Professor Poping, for for you know giving and sharing your your topic in our uh, international conference today. I will see you when I see you. So I'll give the time back to Ibu Nuni. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, okay, everybody. Thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoy this uh, this discussion. Yeah, it's very very good, a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, heaps of thanks are addressed to the three speakers for today. Uh, Professor Irfan uh, from, uh, Professor Insinyur Irfan Dwi Priambada, MN PhD from Universitas Negeri, Universitas Gajah Mada, Associate Professor Anthony Gerard Ryan and Associate Professor Takahiko Matsui from IG University of Education, Japan. And not to forget Professor Kuo Ping Lin from Tuang Hai University, Taiwan. Hopefully we can, uh, from the sharing session, we can learn from each other and then we can improve the quality of uh, student community service, teaching practicum, and internships held in our universities. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. Irfan, Prof. Ryan, and Prof. Uh, Lin. And see you in the next occasion with a different topic to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we are coming up to the last plenary session for today. Three other countries are joining us. Um, the first one is from Uzbekistan, and then the second is from the Netherlands, and the last one is from Germany. From Uzbekistan, we are going to have the presentation of uh, Rima John Sotlikova, PhD, from National University Uzbekistan. And then from the Netherlands, we have Ibu Susan Lutk, MSc, Pimus, Pimust. And then from Germany, we are going to have Dr. Peter Doppler from Wittenstein SE, Germany. This session is chaired by Papa Dr. Uh, Insignor Phil uh, Didi Harianto. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Dr. Didi. The floor is yours.
Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you, uh, Mrs. Nuni. And uh, we are continuing to the last plenary sessions in this ICOP COSE conference. And I will be a moderator in this plenary sessions. Actually, it is an honor for me. So, that it is already mentioned by Mrs. Nuni. We have three distinguished speakers here. Uh, Mrs. Rimajon Sotlikova, PhD, from National University of Uzbekistan. And we have also uh, Mrs. Susan Luch, MSG, BMUS and BMUS ED from University Utrecht, the Netherlands. And the last one we have as also Dr. Peter Dobler, from Wittenstein SE, Germany. So actually, this plenary will be divided into two sessions. The presentations delivered by all the speakers sequentially, and then continuing by the Q and answer sessions. Each speaker will be have uh, 25 minutes for presentations, and then the first presentation will be delivered by Rima John. And beforehand, uh, I would like to uh, read briefly the short biography of Rima John. Uh, Selamat pagi, Ibu Rima. <laughs> and then. Wait a minute. Uh, Rima John, uh, she is a lecturer from National University of Uzbekistan under the name of Mirsu Ulukbek. And she is also a lecturer uh, at the Uzbek State World Language University, Uzbekistan. And She has many experience as a teacher in Indonesia and also in Uzbekistan. Uh, she's graduated from uh, for her bachelor degree in Uzbekistan and for master degree as well for PhD degree in Yogyakarta State University, Indonesia. And she has uh, many scientific article publications and she is uh, she has a capability to speak indonesian as well english russian uzbek and she has an, an extensive number of certificates and awards so rim uh, mrs rima uh, you will be have 25 minutes for presenting your topic. Uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, dear all. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to present a topic today. I'm really glad to meet uh, all my professors here, lecturers, and also uh, uh, from other countries. Thank you very much for everybody uh, to give it, for giving me an opportunity. Opportunity to then talk. So let me. Know. Is it visible? Yeah. Is it visible? Yeah. yeah. Still in progress. Okay. 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 All right. Uh, just a minute. We can see now your slide. Mm -hmm. uh, let me do this full screen first. Is it full screen now? No. Uh, okay. No. Right now, yes. 
Oh, okay, thank you. So uh, today I'm going to present uh, a topic about uh, students' community service in higher education in Uzbekistan. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Wima Sotlikova, and I am English lecturer uh, at the at the National University of Uzbekistan. So uh, I'm going to start my uh, presentation about the objective of student community service in educational system in Uzbekistan. And the first statement uh, on the objectives uh, of uh, student community service is about community service itself. As we all know that community service is this defined as programs linked to higher education that involves participants in activities to deliver social benefits, teach the participants to work jointly towards achieving the common goal. So Uzbekistan educational institutions encourage students' extracurricular activities. Community service activities are good for students before they start their career after graduation. There are many researches revealed that the students' extracurricular activities does contribute the students. And here you can see our president. So he's also having always meetings or, uh, or discussions with uh, youth of Uzbekistan. And he several times he visited to our university also to have discussion with our students about their problem or about the development or improvement of our institution and the activities also. So uh, in the past, uh, when we gained our independence, then uh, the youth social movement was called Camelot. And I also had several activities in this youth, youth so social movement uh, during my school years and university years. Uh, and then it, uh, it changed to another name. Now, uh, the name for this uh, institution or uh, the youth uh, movement is Union of Youth of Uzbekistan. So this is a really a big institution in my country. So the uh, main Union of Youth of Uzbekistan is situated in the capital of Uzbekistan, in Tashkent. Uh, and uh, it has branches. So here you can see our map. So we have 12 regions and we have 12 bra branches of uh, youth movement of Uzbekistan. Uh, so in each um, uh, region, we have uh, several branches for cities and then several branches for schools and uh, educational institutions like uh, universities also, we have branches in every institution in, in education in Uzbekistan of youth movement of uh, Union of Youth of Uzbekistan. So uh, they have um, annually meetings uh, once in a year in capital city in Tashkent and uh, they discuss about the activities for a year and they, uh, they make a plan uh, for the whole year and uh, they provide the objectives uh, and goals for the branch leaders. Uh, so uh, for example, in schools also in every class, they have the leader uh, for this union. So we have so many leaders, the main, um, the main intention of uh, this union of uh, youth of Uzbekistan is uh, to uh, build friendly community and to have more kids in my country. So uh, yeah, I already mentioned about the regions and then how many unions of youth Uzbekistan we have and and in all cities and universities, schools, they have branches. So uh, Uzbekistan Youth Union uh, plays an important role in terms of students' extracurricular activities. The Union of Youth of Uzbekistan is the institution of healthy, spiritually mature and intellectually developed, self-centered young generation aimed at protecting youth from harmful effects and mass media. 
so uh, we always have uh, meetings or uh, we uh, gather together with this union and then we plan uh, our uh, future goals and then we start to uh, organize some kind of activities or events uh, for the sake of uh, youth or for the sake of our country. Uh, so I will mention what kind of uh, events uh, we had or we are having in the future. So today uh, the population of the youth more than 60% and uh, 30th of June is announced to celebrate as the day of youth in Uzbekistan. So it's also widely celebration for youth and it's on the 30th of June. Uh, the first priority is carrying out, uh, carrying out professional activities under the motto, youth is the builder of the future. So that is our, the main motto. The second, uh, the protection of the rights, freedom and interests of youth. So the third, uh, increasing the activity of young people. Build uh, democracy and uh, the following intellectual and creative potential. Uh, fifth, uh, formation and communication technologies, the formation of young people's solid immunity against various ideological threats such as relief extremism and terrorism. So we uh, uh, often uh, organize this kind of event for the youth, uh, extremism or terrorism, uh, to make sure that uh, they are not joining kind of uh, activities. So we often organize these uh, activities uh, and events in other educational uh, institutions. And the sixth, uh, effective actions on prevention of early marriages and divorces of young families. So this also happens in my country. So that's why uh, the, uh, the intention of this union is to uh, provide with the information uh, about the negative sides of divorces, for example, or early marriages. And they go to the institutions and have meetings with young people and they just give their speech or they have a theater program. So they organize theater and they act like actors and show them what are the bad uh, sides of divorces, for example. And the seventh, uh, the involve, uh, involvement of young people in sports, there is training courses, including the study of foreign languages. Uh, so uh, those are uh, our um, university students. So they also participated uh, in competitions and uh, uh, some events and uh, they uh, they won and they were finalists in competitions and they are really doing well in sports. So we have uh, sport clubs in our in institutions. So after classes, uh, they are welcome to have uh, training in sport clubs. And the eighth, uh, the organization of uh, targeted work to provide material and moral support to young families, young people with disabilities and create social uh, conditions for them. Uh, so uh, they provide uh, some uh, donations for um, the people who are dis dis uh, dis who have disabilities, and also they support uh, young families and provide uh, material support too uh, by donating. And the ninth uh, participation in prevention of youth crime. And the 10th, uh, participation in the reforms carried out in Uzbekistan. And the 11th, international cooperation in the field of youth policy protection of the rights of receiving education and working in foreign countries. So we have so many exchange programs uh, in educational system. So they can, uh, uh, they will have opportunity to uh, apply for those programs and then get experience from other countries. Thank you.
and we have dance clubs uh, as extracurricular activities uh, in this uh, union. Uh, so they provide with the uh, trainers and they can train uh, or they can uh, learn how to dance our national dance or international. So another one is volunteer service program. It's an extracurricular activity carried out uh, outside tuition time. No academic credit is provided for that program. Uh, and another one is work study program involves students in tasks and activities, and it requires great ex expertise and experience, administrative teaching, library and technical activities. Today, the students are allowed to work as teachers at kindergartens and schools from their third year of the university study officially. So just recently, our president signed for this program, uh, and now they are allowed to work as a teacher at schools after the classes. And they are really excited about it because I'm teaching now the English language and the subject is uh, uh, teaching English to young learners, uh, teaching English in primary education. So now they will have um, not only theory, but also they will have practical so they can go and earn money as well uh, by teaching because it's now official. And recently we had a presidential election day in Uzbekistan on the 24th of October and youth volunteering activity with guests from foreign countries uh, established in this program. And my students also participated in this volunteering activity. Uh, so here you can see my students. Uh, uh, they were uh, interpreters and translators for uh, the people coming from foreign countries uh, to evaluate uh, the process of election uh, in my country. So they were really excited uh, about being uh, tutors for uh, foreign people. Uh, so they stated that they real it was really engaging. They gained uh, knowledge and experience and they were really excited about it. So having passion and interest to do something is very important, especially in uh, activities like volunteering, which does not give material rewards in return. So our students are really interested and motivated to get involved in community activities. They state that they gain uh, socialization, experience and also knowledge. By engaging with the society, the students will be more aware of the needs of the society and could contribute a better role in the community. Uh, and we are also excited about collaboration and cooperation programs with foreign country educational institutions. And uh, recently we discussed about uh, collaboration with uh, Indonesian institution, especially with Yogyakarta State University. And um, uh, we discussed about it and we are on the process to sign for the memorandum and I'm really happy about it because uh, we are going to share our experience, we are going to share our teaching materials and we are, we are going to get knowledge and experience uh, from each other. Uh, so uh, we are cooperating in teaching field and also Bahasa Indonesia because uh, as I mentioned, I'm teaching English uh, for the uh, for the students, but in my class, uh, they sometimes ask from me that I was in Indonesia and uh, they want me to say something in Bahasa Indonesia. And I, I'm i really happy to hear that. And then I start talking in Bahasa Indonesia and they said that Bahasa Indonesia is really sweet and very polite language. And I, I told them uh, if they want to learn Bahasa Indonesia and they requested about it to our dean. And they agreed because I explained that we can have uh, some kind of programs in Bahasa Indonesia or summer camps, for example, so we can exchange our students. And then they were really excited about it. So now we are going to establish Bahasa Indonesia program also. Uh, right now, uh, I'm, I'm having just um, uh, as extracurricular activity to teach Bahasa Indonesia for the Union uh, of Youth of Uzbekistan. 
like in club, uh, just volunteering. But uh, in the near future, uh, we already plan to establish Bahasa Indonesia, uh, Indonesian language to teach Baha, uh, to teach Indonesian language as a second foreign language in my institution, uh, because uh, our students uh, are learning uh, English language and then. Uh, for their second foreign language, they will have chance to choose uh, one of foreign language. For example, they provide with the foreign language as German, um, uh, German, French, Turkey, uh, Japan languages. And now we will have another language to choose. That is uh, Indonesian language. Uh, so that's why I wanted to talk about it a little bit because I'm really excited about it. And I'm really thankful for uh, for the institution that we are collaborating for Yogyakarta State University. Thank you very much. Uh, it was really interesting conference for me too to share our experience. I learned a lot from other experts and uh, presenters, uh, hearing, uh, knowing their experience in their institutions. And I hope it was interesting for you too about my presentation. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, Rima. Uh, terima kasih banyak, Rima, for your presentation. Sama -sama. Mater nuon, <laughs> Yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. And now we are going to move to the next presenters. We have here uh, Mrs. Susan Lu, MSG, Good Bimus Idi. Good morning. Uh, yeah, good, uh, good morning. <laughs> very good. Yeah. <clears throat> very happy to be here. I'm very sorry. I have a very sore throat. So my um, yeah, normally before. sound better. So I hope you can hear me. Okay, beforehand, I would like to uh, read uh, your short biography. So, music and education have always been a part of her life, Susan's life. She is graduated as a general music teacher, a classical saxophone player, and she earned a master degree in educational science from the University of Utrecht. She was a music teacher in secondary school for a long period of time. Also, she was connected to the University of the Arts Conservatory in Utrecht as lecturer, researcher, and curriculum designer. Now, she works as an independent consultant and workshop leader in music and creativity. She advises schools and organizations concerned with arts and music education about how to adjust to changing time. She gives presentations, quotes, and inspire teachers, reflect upon and consult in curriculum change and advice management. Since 2017, she also wrote books. The first book is about creativity and what are the mm -hmm as support creativity. In the second book, she proposed a new fundament for music education in these changing times. Since 2021, she is also course leader of the Master in Art Education of the XQ Utrecht. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a lot. Um, as I said, my voice is bad, which is... Um, not too good for a singer, but um, <clears throat> I will try to keep myself understood. So if that's a problem, please raise your hand. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, today about a lot of things, but uh, I choose to talk about um, student practice in arts, uh, high, uh, in art uh, univer universities and our philosophy um, about how do you teach students to be a teacher. So I will share my... Um, uh, share share my screen, and I hope you will see um, my screen now. Is that the case? Yes. Fan, that's good. So, how do we teach students how to teach? I have been. Um, I am involved with the University of the Arts in Utrecht, the Netherlands, 
Um, this maybe needs a bit of explanation for you. In the Netherlands, we have two types of higher education. We have what you will recognize at the university where theory is taught. <clears throat> and we also have a higher education that we call higher vocational education. And that's where you really are taught the, the skills for different subjects. Being a teacher, uh, you become in both, both schools, you can become a teacher. Um, in university, you will study a subject for three or four years, and then after that, get a, a, a teacher degree. Um, but in the higher vocational training, you will do it all as a holistic thing. So you're both trained in your subject as a, as, as a teacher. And I will talk about this higher vocational education because I've been involved with the higher vocational arts education in Utrecht, um, Hogeschool voor de Kunsten in Utrecht. Oh, let me just. Uh, uh, and the higher, uh, the higher arts university in, the, in Utrecht has different schools fine art, design, games and fashion, art and economy, media, music and technology, theater. The Utrecht Conservatory, which is the music school, <clears throat> and the School of Creative Transformation. And in a few of these schools, fine art, theater, the conservatory, and also creative transformation, in these schools you can find uh, the education departments as well. So you can become, for example, the Utrecht Conservatory, you can become a classical saxophone player, but you can also become a general music teacher. And these are different uh, bachelors. So it's actually not the same bachelor. So if you become a general teacher, you will be trained as a teacher in music, which is quite a um, uh, complex thing because you will have to train both your musical ability and your teaching uh, skills. And we try to do this uh, in a holistic sense. So we're not putting them uh, separate, but we really try to combine them. Um, for the HKU, uh, my school, my high school, there's a few, a lot of, or a few things um, that we're aiming at for a future. We're looking, as a school, we're looking into new practices in our artistic professions. The world of art is really changing. Um, and especially in the Netherlands, <clears throat> we are um, a very much economy-based country. And sometimes art is looked upon as something that's... Um, it's something for the rich or for the wealthy. And uh, we're looking for a way to really get art in the heart of society again, in the midst of society. We're also looking into ways of having our students become lifelong learners. They're just in the university for a few years, four years, five years, maybe tops. But how can we get them to be, um, to be learning their whole life? Because uh, our world is changing so fast. They have to adapt all the time. Uh, which we all know the last few ye years have been a good example of this. How do you, how do you adapt to China, times like this? But also creative technology. Um, how do we work with stuff like Zoom or whatever in the arts? How do we get society to be active participants? And also how can we become a learning community? I really enjoyed the last speaker talking about youth being a really community. How can we become a community of learners, a community that really self adapts to the environment. So I really like the idea of really becoming a union there. Um, so question we are asking yourself, of, oh, I am asking myself and in the Netherlands, well, what skills, knowledge and attitude do you need to be able to teach? So maybe I would like to make it a bit more interactive. No, I can't see the chat, but maybe you can you can write down in the chat. Um, what do you think? What do you think? What skills and knowledge and attitude do you need to be able to become a teacher? And I think I can see the chat arriving somewhere. Can you write this down for me? So what do you think? Not, you know, we're not looking for a theory, but if you think about a teacher you really loved, you know, what was this teacher able to do? What skills did they, did they have? and what knowledge, and which attitude. And there's some chats coming in, I can see this. Peter says, hi, Peter. Passion in the topic and for the students. That's two ways already, right? 
Anybody else? What do we need to become a teacher? <clears throat> I see somebody, I see people typing, so I'm just gonna wait a bit. Um, to already respond to Peter, um, motivated for the subjects which they teach, Rima, thanks. So that's what Peter says to the passion for the topic and for the students. Peter, you say the two things, right? You have your own content, but you also have the relationship experience. That's interesting, Rima. I heard you talk about your students in the third year becoming teachers. I was very interested in that, how that works, because they will have theory building. So how does it work when they you throw them in front of 30 toddlers? Collaboration, oh, that's how they do that, thanks. Pedagogical knowledge, Monique, that's interesting. Um, so pedagogic is for me is a very, um, it's a difficult word in the Netherlands. I think we have a different uh, explanation. Communication skills, yes. I think if we go on, we will be able to build our new uh, um, educational environment with this. Technical knowledge as well, yeah. Values, that's interesting, Kuhn. <laughs> subject matter, yeah, so that's knowledge of your subject. Values, I find that very interested. Yeah. Ability to transfer knowledge between, yeah, transfer the knowledge between different subjects, especially for a primary school. Somebody has their noise on. Methodology, that's the way you teach stuff. So go from one part to the other. Knowledge and skills in assessing. Assessing student progress, exactly. How do we get students to get into a deeper understanding? Well, thank you very much. I'll please continue saying this because um, I think this is the main question. Skills, knowledge, and attitude. So you need to be able to do stuff, which is something you do in action, but you have to know stuff as well, which is in your head. But there's also some kind of basic attitude towards teaching. Teaching is not something... Um, you just, uh, you know, you can learn from an Ikea sheet. So step one is this, and then you do that. Um, it's, a, it's a certain attitude towards the other one. Uh, now, if you look for, um, uh, you know, little pictures about teaching, you get this type of stuff, which is, I, I find very interesting. Um, so what's essential skills for teachers? And you see here, creative, positive learning environments, confidence building, classroom management, child care. Or I think there's even more. I, I found this one too. Uh, organization, tolerance, storytelling, open questions, commitment, preparation, innovative, social. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to learn. Or um, 21st century teachers, what do they need to be? Researchers, digital designers, leaders, cooperative, inclusive, reflective, creative, storytelling. Um, it's quite, quite a thing. Here we find this, uh, this teacher, she needs all this and we see then which i think is quite is a quite a complicated thing um is that being a teacher really means you are you need to learn a lot of things and it's not just the knowledge it's the knowledge into practice so how do you transfer your knowledge of a subject or even your knowledge about pedagogy how do you translate that into practice in the Netherlands, and especially at the Arts Institute I work at, we have a conviction that um, if you want to learn how to teach, you have to be in the place where learning is done. So really, we say you can't learn to be a teacher if you're not in school. Because if you're not in school, you, you won't have the, the holistic approach to, to teaching, because you might have thought about preparing a lesson, and then you get into this, the classroom and then there's 25 kids and they think differently. And then it comes to your ability to really uh, be a pedagogue of to communicate with the kids or to build a relationship. But it's not two things. You have to do this all in all combined. Um, so in the Netherlands, actually, um, practice is at the core of our education. If you want to become a music teacher, um, you, you, you first... Of course, you have high school, so you, you might be 17 years old and you do your admittance exam to the, to the, music, um, uh, the music school um, and they will, will see whether you're, you have music ability. 
And then, okay, you start in school in September and in October, you will have your first practice. You will go every Wednesday morning, you will go to a primary school. So you haven't learned anything yet, basically, but you will be in school and you will teach little lessons, not large days, but you will teach little lessons. And you will be um, coached by the teacher in the school. And also the teacher from the, from the university will come in once every month to coach you and you will do coaching co-teaching so you will go together with a classmate and the two of you together will do reflection and finally you will be come back to the university and in the afternoon you will discuss what happened in the classroom um, and it's not about being right or wrong but it's about really getting the practice the core business of what you're learning into your education um, we really believe in the system and also uh, we have educational science to really, um, well, to really tell us that we might be on the right track. This, this handsome fella here is Vygotsky. You probably all know him, maybe not. He's a, he's a Russian um, uh, educational science. And actually he's from the 1926 or so, like he's, he's kind of old, but he had a philosophy, an educational philosophy called social constructivism. And what that meant was he said, in the end, in the end, the student himself is constructing his own knowledge, skills, and attitude. This means as a teacher, me in university too, I can do all kinds of stuff. I can be very inspiring. I can do everything. But if my students think it, it's not interesting what I'm telling or it's not really responding to them, they will not learn. Same here. I can, be, I can try and contact you through this medium. But if you decide there's other things to be worried about, you won't, you won't really learn from me. But if you have questions and you think, oh, um, let me just listen to her, you will learn. But I really don't have so much influence on what you learn. It's all about you deciding you want to learn. That's what Vygotsky called constructivism. He calls, calls it social constructivism because he says that we actually we learn the most from our social environments, from the people surrounding us which is interesting, <clears throat> the yellow dot here, is that what we can already do? Vygotsky says we are born with skills and attitude. Um, and we, we, you know, we add some theory to that, but we can do stuff. And around us is stuff we are just about able to do. Um, the, he calls that the zone of proximal, proximal development. It's the zone where almost, almost, we can almost get there. Now, what we try to do in our uh, practice in the university is get our students to go from their yellow phase into the light blue. And we do this by throwing them into the real life of education. That is where the real, real questions are. It's, we can't um, do this in the classroom because then we play with, you know, with, your, with, your, co with your peers, with your peer, with your, with your colleagues and students. So you need to have the school in vision. And that's where the learning questions of our students is born in the school. Um, Vygotsky tells, talks about modeling, scaffolding and fading, which I think is a beautiful model. He says, the first thing you do, if we want to get the students to become good teachers, we model them. So if I teach my students in university, I try to be the teacher I like them to become. Um, so I model them. I, am, I try to be a role model. But then at one point they go to, into their schools and I can't model them because I'm not there. But what I do try to do, I scaffold them, which is scaffolding is um, it's what we use in building houses. You know, when you build up this thing to, you can get a step higher every time, you know, like that's how we build. A scaffold is actually you put um, some support under the student and the student can step on that support and go further than there. But I'm not, I'm not pulling them on the, on the step. I'm inviting them to come on the step. So I'm giving them advice. I, I reflect with them. I help them understand what ha happening. And in the end of our education... Yeah. In the end of uh, education, we fade again. So we try to 
um, because the student has to become an independent teacher. So in the end, after four years, we fade as, um, as helpers and we, get, we go to the background. Okay, so what do we teach in education? I'm also there in the university. We teach holistic education with a professional task at the heart. So we try to get our students to become the best version of themselves. So we do not try to make them copies of us. We not try to make like, like all little, little Susans, for example, but we try to have them reflect upon who do I wanna be as a teacher and what do I need? And they learn this in the schools. So you see here, the black uh, V is actually what we think is important to become a teacher. So it's actually the content we play with. But you see all this, this for teachers, they walk their own paths. In the end, they will become autonomous uh, versions of themselves, but they will be, become better and better and better. In the university, of course, we teach theory and practical and artistic skills and creative skills and research skills and reflective skills. Um, but the teaching practice is always at the heart. So all these subjects are uh, actually um, combined together. So, um, so there, we don't just teach you artistic skills just to be artistic, but we teach you artistic skills so you can translate them to your teaching practice. Um, and that's uh, what we, stop share. That's how we try to get our students to become the best versions of themselves in, a, in, in the weary world of education. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Susan. So now we are going to the next presenter we have here. Uh, Dr. Peter Doppler, so from Wittgenstein SE Germany. Uh, guten Morgen, Peter. Good morning, Dietrich. Yeah, morning. So beforehand, I would like to read the Peter short biography here that I already have. So Dr. Peter Doppler, his, his diploma studies at the University of Applied Science, Wolfsburg, uh, at Business Administration, Marketing and Information Economy. And he was graduated from master studies at the Dresden U International University in Communication Psychology and he was graduated from Technical University Dresden for his doctoral degree at the Educational Technologies. And he is an employee at Marketing Department. He is also an executive for process development and then the executive for organizational development he is also a lecturer at the Corporate State University, Baden Wurttemberg, Germany, of course, right? And then yes. he is right now working on Wittgenstein SE Germany. So, Peter, you have uh, 30 minutes for presenting your topic regarding the industrial training or internships. The time is uh, yours. So thank you very much, Didik. Do you see my screen, the yeah. slides? So that's quite fine. So good afternoon to all the persons from far Asia or Central Asia and good morning to Susan in, in the Netherlands. Uh, we are in a different time zone, but I'm really envy to all of you in, uh, in, in far Asia because when you see my picture, sadly, I could not use the, the background because due to uh, IT security reasons, I could, could only attend via Zoom with the web access. So you, you have to look at my not very well cleaned uh, office here in the company. And I'm angry because if I'm looking outside the window, it rains and it's not the 30 degrees far, uh, Celsius you have in Jakarta. We have six degrees plus and it rains, rains, rains. 
So uh, the light is not the night, but it's the morning in Germany, as you can see. Um, when uh, I talked to Ms. Nunik and to uh, Mr. Harianto, they said to me, uh, Peter, please uh, deliver and do a presentation, but please do it not in a way of a lecture, but uh, do it in a, a different way. Uh, talk to uh, your experiences uh, in the industry and here in, uh, in the field of internship in the industry. So um, I'm going to show you some facts from uh, the topic internships, how to get internships. How is this topic internship for students uh, at universities or even high schools or um, secondary schools uh, um, handled in, in Germany? Uh, and please be aware that it's, it's a point of view from Germany and maybe uh, I can also speak for, for Europe. Uh, otherwise, as Susan has to say, Peter, you're in the completely uh, different and in the completely wrong direction. Uh, the the thing is the the lecture not the lecture the presentation is about the possibilities and the requirements you you can face within German companies but because I, I think that many of uh, your students if you are a high school lecturers or if you are a university professors and lecturers are all uh, also interested in doing uh, internships also maybe abroad or for foreign companies. So the agenda would be um, a, a short introduction about me uh, and the company. Please uh, don't think that's a marketing thing I'm going to say. Uh, please look at it as a blueprint for many, many uh, kinds or many, many different companies here in Germany. But they also have similar foundations and similar uh, attitudes and everything else. So you can copy that to, uh, from one to, to the other company in, 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 in some certain instance. Then uh, it, it's worth to look at the education, educational system in Germany. Susan did that in her presentation before when she told about those two different um, um, uh, higher education styles. And I guess the, the German educational system uh, Didi Carianto will, uh, I guess, will agree with me. We, we know each other very well from Dresden. Uh, he, he learned those uh, different styles in which uh, the Germans think and uh, do their education. So it's worth uh, having a look, look for it because that relates very, very strong to, to going into the topic of internship. Then a short uh, a step back into my company, what qualification do we need? And how do we uh, um, educate our young colleagues uh, in, in, in every possibility? Then at the fourth point, how we uh, can look at internships as a whole, what for qualification we need. And at the end, I'm looking forward for some discussions, maybe uh, directly at the end of my presentation or during uh, the panel speech. So. The speaker, um, as you can see, the picture you see here on my slide and on the uh, uh, on the homepage of the conference is quietly different to the person you see in uh, on on your uh, screen. Uh, Corona has uh, took his toll on me. I'm not the longer the the smooth faced uh, guy. Uh, I guess uh, you can see me with this uh, picture very well. And this picture will uh, accompany me uh, between, uh, during my presentation here. Um, Didi Carianto was so kind and has already said something about my, uh, my career steps, my educational history. It's not to say, hey, what cool guy is, is talking to, uh, to you, but it should show you uh, that I could really uh, talk to this topic because I had plenty of times doing um, internships at uh, very different companies to look for my passion, to look for my attitude, to look for the way I'm like to, to do. And if you see the middle part um, here, uh, I started as an employee in the marketing department, I guess, 20 years ago. Uh, and now uh, I'm an executive for ex uh, organizational development. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a transformation that uh, was made uh, in my, my career, but also in my person. Uh, and that reflects uh, also the, uh, uh, the, the educational steps. When I did first an apprenticeship, uh, that's a dual education 
thing in Germany and as an industrial management assistant. And in the end, I transformed to business administration. This is a very linear thing, but then it breaks. And in my company, some person said, hey, we are an engineering company. Why did you uh, do those communication psychology thing and not engineering studies? I can uh, show you later uh, with that. And in the end, uh, you see at the, uh, at the end of the slide, and it's not uh, a point of hierarchy, I'm a father of two daughters and one of them, she's turning, she's turned 18 this year. She's very uh, eager to look for internships. And uh, so I can uh, see what she's thinking, what, what she's looking for and uh, what is uh, necessary for her to, uh, to do uh, um, some, uh, some things to get their feet into the door in, in different companies or hospitals in that way. So, my company, the Wittenstein SE, it's, uh, it's a slightly big company. We're consisting of 2,800 people uh, on the whole world. In Germany, we do have, I guess, 1,900 persons. And we uh, have a turnover from around 380 million euros, which, which sounds very big. But what's more interesting is we were established 70 years ago from the Wittenstein family the father of the now uh, owner. And uh, our products there were sewing machines for ladies uh, gloves. So uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, ladies were wearing uh, um, gloves to their uh, uh, dinners, uh, suits and uh, evening suits. But as soon uh, the, the company and the owners realized uh, that's not the way we are going to exist. Um, no one wants to, to, uh, um, to wear gloves anymore. And then we transformed over the years. And now we are in a mechanical engineering company that started in the 80s of the last century. Uh, that sounds very, very old, but it's only 40 years ago. And then we transformed in an electromechanical uh, and electronics and software company, what you can see in the 2020s where we completely uh, uh, started to change our our business field. And I started, I said, the bearded guy is uh, transforming in, here and there in the um, slides. I started in 1996 when a company consisted of 200 persons. Now we have 2,700 persons. And that's the way I said before. Uh, if you start in one position, it's very, very seldom, at least here in Germany or in high tech companies, that you will stay on this place. And that's a fact. If I do have young colleagues who are doing an internship here in my department, I say to them, that's at the moment what you're looking for. But please be so open-minded and look for all the other opportunities and things that are going to be. Please, please be fluent in, in a way of your own development. Um, we are distributed worldwide. You can see that. We have 25 locations and also one location in Indonesia. It's a distributor there. Settler, I could not uh, um, locate him very much, I guess. It's on the Java Island uh, near Jakarta, at least uh, I guess so. But what's more interesting, we do have production plants in the US, in Switzerland, in Romania, and we are trying to build up one in, um, in Asia, probably in China or, or one of the sur surrounding uh, countries. But what, why do I say that? That means if I'm going to uh, apply for an internship in an international company, I always have to be aware that um, the persons who are hiring me for one week, three months or six months at least, they say English, as out of a German point of view, English is not a foreign language. Uh, they think... English should be your second mother tongue. If that's working, it's, it's the, uh, on the other way, but at least your face to have your uh, abilities also in foreign languages. And it's much better if you have much more ability, language ability, uh, at least in, um, sorry to say that Susan, not in, uh, 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 in, in Netherlands uh, language in uh, Flemish or anything else, but at least in French or Spanish uh, or Italian, that's uh, quite quite fine. So that's one thing you you have to keep in mind. Another thing you have to keep in mind is 
the company I'm looking for, how should, uh, how do the uh, the company earns uh, its its money? Uh, in in which fields uh, does the company uh, is working? I could not apply for a uh, um, a healthcare job in an industrial complex in the end. At least you can do that at Daimler-Benz maybe or Siemens where they have 200,000 people and their own uh, medical doctors and everything else. But if you're looking for the so-called German Mittelstand, the mid-sized companies, uh, they are very, very technically oriented. Uh, you see that in, in our products and, and our competencies, it reaches from machine and plant construction, our medical technology, uh, uh, automotive, uh, back to, to um, aerospace and everything else, you should have an attitude and have an app, uh, a passion into those technical fields. If you don't have that, it's hard for you to enjoy your uh, uh, internships you have. At least I can show you where I work when the sun is shining. I said today the sun is shining, uh, I guess, in Indonesia or in, in Southern Africa, but not here in Germany. Uh, if you can see my mouse, then you can see me here in the second floor. That's the so-called old building and everything else was built in the last 30 years. Uh, it also shows that we, we have here an, uh, a sense of, of, of aesthetics in, also in, in our, um, our architecture and in the way we are working. So it's not only working. Uh, it's, it's also uh, bringing yourself into the company to some certain uh, agree, a degree. So that's the company. And as I said, it's not a marketing show I, I'm doing that, but uh, it's, it's a thing. This could be a, a blueprint, a copy for many, many different um, companies. And I'll show you as, uh, in the next slide an association we are the member in. Uh, it's formerly a German association, uh, so-called Verband Deutscher Maschinen- und Anlagebauer. I guess it sounds very, very hard in the, the pronunciation. They transformed it into the English one in Mechanical Engineering Industry Association. Um, and therefore, this is an association that consists of more than 3,000 companies uh, in, in Europe. And they stand from 1.3 million employees. Uh, only in uh, uh, not only in Germany from more than one million employees, it, it, which means if you want to have an internship in a technical field, uh, in an engineering company, you're very well uh, recommended to look on those home pages to look for the, the companies uh, which were uh, which are there, uh, which are member uh, of those association and look there to to get a deeper insight in the companies or maybe also in the fields of interesting uh, interest you you have uh, for your um, uh, internship that's why i say winstein is is one typical member of those uh, those companies and all of them uh, share one thing and that's uh, i think a big difference where we have uh, compared to to uh, asia uh, maybe uh, far Asia, Central Asia, anything else. We all, all the companies there are lack for have a lack for skilled workers and knowledge workers. Um, uh, we heard uh, in the first lecture that uh, in Uzbekistan there are 60 percent, if I have uh, have it in mind, 60 percent of youth uh, compared to the total population. I guess I can speak for Germany and also for for the Netherlands. Susan, please correct me if I'm wrong that we are completely opposite to those figures. Uh, the, this, uh, uh, the share of youth compared to the total population in, uh, at least in Germany, is uh, getting less and less and less. So that's the, the fact why we are lacking skilled workers. And everyone or every, or every company is looking for having um, um, so get your, your fingers on, on well-educated persons that fits to your company, uh, which means uh, the coming years will be very, very hard for mid-sized companies to compete with the big players, with the so-called name, with all those automobile producers, just like Porsche in Germany, or BMW, or uh, Audi, or uh, VW, and everything else. 
everyone who says, oh, I like those shiny things and I, I want to uh, work for a big company is looking for them and, and uh, only in the second instance for those mid-sized companies. So time is ripe for uh, internships uh, in mid-sized companies. Everyone is, is looking for the persons and not only for, for, uh, for the people, or for the students uh, in, in, uh, from Germany, but also from students from abroad. So the skilled workers uh, shortage, uh, some uh, figures for, he, uh, for you. More than 80% of all those association companies says we could not get enough academics, especially engineers. But not only engineers, uh, it's also for, uh, for everyone else. More than 80% lack for skilled workers. Uh, that's a thing of our dual education apprenticeship thing, uh, which means that we have an education with vocational school and within companies or um, um, uh, economic chambers. And at least 30% of all of the companies lack, have a shortage in master craftsmen. That means you have to be a master craftsman, you have to have a dual education and then advanced training for that. What we don't have a lack is in unskilled workers. But that's, that doesn't mean we have enough unskilled workers. The, it's it's uh, the other way around. It means there is no need for unskilled workers because we need highly trained and well-educated persons for high-tech products, uh, which were built here in Germany. Uh, because all those lesser technology could be built everywhere in the world uh, to a less, uh, much cheaper price. Uh, we are uh, a very expensive country and therefore we have to sell those high-tech things. And what I said before, uh, what faces us in 2030 is that we, got in a, uh, we are getting a decrease in employed persons between 3 and 5 percent every year. That, uh, that means we, uh, we're losing uh, approximately 200 to 300,000 persons in the uh, employment uh, field every year, and we could not compete that. So society is getting older, less birth instead of growing deaths. So we depend on highly motivated and skilled employees. And uh, that's what I said. It's necessary and it's the field is right for for um, persons uh, who would like to have an internship one short um, journey to the educational system i guess Didi Karyante could express it in in much more much uh, easier way even in in, in uh, indonesian um, in a language to you but uh, i don't want to be boring with that uh, it's it should show you that this educational system had uh, its influence, uh, even if it's indirectly the influence uh, on the internships. We do have a school phase, that's the primary school, as many, many uh, countries with us. And then we divide into secondary schools and into high schools. Uh, the secondary school is uh, uh, also divided into two uh, different uh, branches, but uh, let's uh, go to the secondary school, which means you are um, done with the school in the secondary school in the age of 16 and normally you decide to do your way into the high school or you say i'm going to do a dual education so if you're going to do a dual education there's not much room for for doing an internship because at the age of 14 or 15 uh, seldom a company will hire you for an internship due to uh, a reg a regular and low rec uh, restrictions. If you go to high school, then uh, you finish that uh, high school between 17 and 19. There you have the opportunity to, to orientate yourself. That's what my, my daughter did. Uh, at the age of 17, she made an internship in the hospital and look for for an uh, education for an apprenticeship uh, as a nurse um, so this is the first time young people are uh, going into touch with the internship on the right side of the slides you see the professional orientation phase that means what i said dual education that's uh, an education did between companies vocational schools and chambers of industry and commerce at the age 15 up but then it's interesting, we do have three different types of, of um, universities. 
the corporate state university. Uh, you join there at the age of 17 or 18. And then you are bound to a company. That means your semester is divided into one trimester at the company and one trimester at the university. So time for a internship is not given. Time for internships is given in the next two uh, types of university. You can do it at the University of Applied Science during your semester uh, holidays. Or, and what, uh, what is more interesting, there are two mandatory practical semesters in a business environment you have to do. So that's your chance to have an internship for six months. And many, many companies rely on that and offer um, a, a practicum uh, uh, or internship offers on their homepages. On the normal, uh, in brackets, university, uh, it's voluntary for you to look for, for internships during your um, semester holidays or if you're going to have a, um, um, a holiday semester, then you could can do that uh, also. But it's not as mandatory as it is in the University of Applied Science. So that's a thing, as you can see, which influences your attitude and your approach to, to internship. Which means most internships are voluntary in Germany. Um, a good start could be a company scholarship. Many, many mid-sized companies do that uh, uh, scholarships uh, for high schools to get their um, um, employees for the future. Uh, it's also a possibility to uh, reduce the dropout rate here in apprenticeships, also in universities and companies. Uh, let's uh, see what Peter the bearded one is saying the average dropout rate in universities in Germany are between 25 to 30 percent, which is very, very high. But if you are talking about STEM courses, scientific, technology, um, engineering, and uh, mathematics, those dropout rates are much, much higher. And what you have to face, there is no real standardized specification. Every company has its own style of internship. And you can do it uh, at least whenever you want and you have the time. Many companies are looking for persons who say, yes, we'd like to do an internship because we as companies uh, think if you do our job good, the internship student will stay with us. So what do we need as uh, for qualifications? I see I spoke for uh, about 20 minutes. I will rush through it. We have different, 10 different uh, uh, dual education shops here in, in our company and 12 different kind of studies uh, in association with the corporate state university. So there's plenty of uh, topics that interested young per, uh, people can look for it and do their internships. You can see here our so-called talent arena. That's the, the, the building where all our uh, young uh, education um, uh, employees are working in, which means we have commercial apprenticeships. You can see that two apprenticeships, uh, um, two different apprenticeships and five different studies with the corporate state university. We have technical apprenticeships, much more, which uh, uh, is the fact due to our business. As I said before, we are a high tech company and with a high tech company is looking for technical um, apprenticeships and series. Uh, more than six different apprenticeships and four different studies. And it's not enough. We also do our education in, in the field of uh, information technologies. Uh, there we offer also different apprenticeships and studies. And what is meant by that? We do that uh, and we offer all those persons who are interested in an inter internship, the possibility to look inside those different fields of education we have. As a whole, what we recommend is before de deciding for a job, look for an internship to see if it's the real thing for you. I did many, many uh, um, uh, internships, at least four or five in marketing, um, companies and uh, uh, in business uh, in marketing uh, consultant companies 
to realize in the end, I like to study that, but working with that is not my uh, way of, of, of living. So I choose in the end uh, doing some, some um, practical things into the field of process development and process uh, redesign. That was the way uh, I ended for a in-between step and now I'm ending in the organization um, uh, development. If you're looking by at Winstein, we have a regular or basic internship that lasts for one week and shows all aspects of our dual education program I showed you before. That means you can work with construction software. You can work at the workbenches and doing real work for customers. Uh, also, that's because of safety reasons. You, you're allowed to do some minor work at our CNC machinery things. So it's very, very broad what you can do within one week. Uh, most of them is with this mandatory uh, uh, internship. Those are abbreviations, this OIB, BOORS, uh, and everything else. That are internships that are mandatory during your school time, and they last between three days and one week. But we also offer voluntary internships, and those voluntary internships, I show you in the following thing. Sorry that I uh, wrote that in English. I put it from the website, and the uh, website, um, is for those career things and internships at, at the moment only in German. There we are looking and offering a, a job for an internship in our HR department. And now I show you Miriam. Miriam is a, a very nice colleague of mine. She's an, uh, or she was a student at the Würzburg uh, University, at the University of Würzburg, and she made a, holi a vacation semester and joined for six uh, months my department and um, that's a thing you can do on those internship offer websites on the career things and we're not the only one sadly we're not the only one uh, that's a photo of our daily newspaper on the left side uh, that's a company not far away from my company they offer also internships and they go a, sh a, a, a thing much farther or further you can see those two persons with those uh, um, uh, big suits and, 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 and thick suits, they also offer internships abroad. This was an a, a internship offer in Norway. So if if I was young, I would, would be a young person and I can be uh, attend at an internship in Norway, I would be uh, the first one to be there. And it's not only the small um, companies that offer those. You can see it here in uh, on the right side. Even Porsche and everything and every other big company is looking desperately for new colleagues and to to offer the, the opportunities we have. So up to the end, what qualification? Qualifications are not really in the field of how to engineer and everything else. What's really interesting and uh, necessary is the interest in the subject area and the will to try to find different areas in my uh, uh, in, in my thing. Mechanical engineering could be in the field of automotive, but also in the field of um, um, robotics or everything else. So be open-minded. If you're in uh, studying at the university and you're applying for an uh, internship, at least you need some kind of basic experience. That's what we, we, uh, we, think that uh, a student should have. But what's more, you should, should have a knowledge of the company. That's what I do those marketing stuff. Uh, if I apply at Wittgenstein, I should know what they are doing. I should know what their products uh, offer and how they are thinking and what their attitude is. And what's necessary, in my opinion, is the desire for new challenges. That's what I said. When I uh, started in uh, the beginning of, uh, in the end of the 90s, I was in the marketing department and I I, I had the, the opportunity to do to do other things, and I did that. So I guess it's necessary in, in these days. And what I said before, you need a certain degree of good language skills if you're working for um, international companies. Which means, Miriam, uh, my my colleague, learned during her studies uh, during her internship uh, the programming um, as a language Python to to do things. And during my um, internships at the marketing companies, I had to 
face Apple computers and I'm still not their friends. Uh, sorry for all the Apple fans on, on, uh, on the channel. But um, I had to, to face that. I had to go with it. And that, uh, what was far, for, for more, furthermore uh, important, I had to think like a uh, foreign designer, a Leiden designer. So that's the requirements I think are very, very necessary. And with that, I'm to the end from my uh, presentation. I spoke to five minutes too, too much. Uh, so sorry for that, Didik. Uh, I have to, to confess and I'm looking forward for discussions uh, now or in the plenum. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your presentation about the uh, intensive or industrial trainings. And we are now opening for the question and answer sessions. We have already uh, Ibu Kun, they already raised hand. Please, Ibu. Did it, is, this all, is it only with me, but I could not hear. Maybe yeah, Dr. Kuhn has muted. Your son is too, too low. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yes. No, it's okay, good. thank you very much, but Didi. Uh, firstly, I would like to... Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, I would like to uh, have question for Susan Luke. Yeah. Hi, Susan. Hi, good. Thank you Glad very much to... for coming, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, meet you again. Uh, actually, I had already in Holland many times, more than 10 times, yeah, 12 times, exactly. Yeah. Uh, why I come there because every time I come there I found uh, the new thing especially in the method of the teacher using of the lecture using and right now I know because you uh, explained that uh, to be teacher we have to be myself with my heart with our hearts yeah, uh, yeah. my question is uh, how we can teach with our heart and how you make students uh, make a teach with their heart and the second time in the second uh, question is uh, actually uh, I have been there uh, more than 10 years and now I know what I found actually I would like to know how the philosophy of Holland teaching and right now you explain to me based on practice <laughs> yeah this is uh, my my answer uh, yeah your answer is uh yeah uh yeah it's my my question so uh, could you please to explain uh, more about this and yeah. uh, i would like to ask to mr doppler uh, peter doppler too yeah uh, german is a uh, advanced uh, country has and has high technology however <laughs> I wondering about uh, the the view of people because uh, around 10 years ago when I uh, went to Museum of Mozart uh, I'm a music education and I came, came to Museum Mozart uh, through German and in the train I met a old woman uh, she saw me uh, I yeah, I wear a uh, hijab, and she asked me where where will you go? I I said that I will go to Musad Museum, and she very surprised. How oh, you Muslim? Why you you play Beethoven? Oh, you play Mozart? Yes. So that's why I I I wondering what uh, the opinion, what the view of people of German about uh yeah the the. The, uh, yeah, the the religions, yeah. Because I'm wondering, uh, in my in Indonesia, we are most uh, Muslim. It's okay for us to play music. However, when I came to uh, German, people of 
Jerman, a thing that is not uh, is forbidden for Muslim to play music. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And the last uh, question I would like to ask uh, Mbak uh, Rima yeah, from uh, Uzbekistan. Yeah. I wondering about uh, the problem of the young. Uh, uh, young young people to get uh, married, yeah. Uh, why this uh, happen? Is uh, based on religions or other thing? Because I have student, yeah. They uh, may, uh, uh, I have students that if they they have a uh, belief that the same thing. If the religion is uh, they, they said that based from religions. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shall I start with answering or? No, okay, uh, please, Susan. So, so Kun, very, very happy to see you again. So it took us 12 times visit to, for me to clear, make it clear to you. But your question about how do you teach students to teach from the heart <laughs> is actually um, a question I find very difficult. I really related to all, all three um, presentations because somewhere we're connected. We're trying to get young people to find their passion and once you find your passion, you know how to find a place in the, in the world that's meaningful to you. What we try to do with our students is, um, if I'm if I'm if I'm very honest, there's two things we teach them to become educational. Um, um, uh, they design education, so they make when they're at home, they make lessons and they design it. But then the most important thing is once you get in the classroom, you really have to start building relationships. And I think that the passion awakens in my students when they're in, when they're having this communication and these skill or um, relations with the kids in the school. So that's where I see the passion arising. And then of course, my, I have it good because my students are already very much uh, full of passion for their music subject. That's why they choose to become music teachers. So I, I think Peter actually has a more difficult job to get young people interested for a subject that might not be so so sexy, so to speak. You know, music is in young people often, more often maybe than technology. Uh, but that's how we try to do it. So to really get them in the world with their music. So it's not only about your music, it's about using music in the world bit of a fake answer but, um, but you know what i mean thank you very much okay uh, peter okay thank you yeah i'm on thank you very much uh, dr astuti i guess it's uh, it, it's a very interesting question and uh, um, to be honest not not very very easy to to answer with that um, but uh, I guess I, I put it in that way. Uh, it depends uh, not really on the topic religion as, as, as a topic, but um, more on the internationalities. Uh, it depends on how old was those lady who's talking with you. And if, if you were in a rural area, um, then uh, those topics of internationality race uh, came up in the last let me say, 30, 20, 20 to 30 years. Um, I was, uh, I'm living here in a very, very, very rural area. <laughs> Didika Yandu will, uh, <laughs> will, will uh, say yes uh, about that. And uh, the only international things I faced as a child and as a, as, uh, as a teenager were the American soldiers which were placed here uh, in all those barracks. Uh, defending us for, for, for uh, defending us in the Cold War from the Russians. So that was our our topic of internationality, and it means that uh, those diversity we are now facing with television, with internet, and everything else, it does not happen. I could not think that my daughters would have told to you about wearing uh, your scarf, uh, that they would have uh, answered you, "Oh, you're interested in music," because they were taught by us and we have the chance to bring them to Indonesia at least uh, with that. So uh, uh, we had the chance to be two years uh, ago uh, on Bali, like every tourist. But four years ago, I was in Jakarta at the university. So uh, they were used to talk to different persons with different uh, uh, religions and everything else. 
And most elderly people, including my parents, my mother's now turning 80. My father sadly passed away two years ago. He was 20, uh, 80, 83. Uh, they, 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 also, they don't have any problem with this one is a Buddhist, this one is a, a Muslim, this one is a Christian or everything else. They took it as it came and they made their uh, their their opportunity uh, their their, uh, their their meanings about their behavior, and uh, I guess the the fact is that someone is uh, surprised that Muslims and who are Muslims who is the typical Muslim in Hunet um, uh, are listening music is that uh, in the Western television you often heard. The things that in Afghanistan and Syria or all those places of atrocities, such things like music are not allowed. And then it's an easy conclusion to say, oh, they are Muslims. And it's just like our Christians, they are Protestants and Catholics. Uh, uh, they have to uh, do this and that. And then they, you make a copy about that. But I don't think so, and I hope so, that it was an offense. It was a really surprise and a really interest in this, but it, it depends on on uh, the the internationality and how how much you are faced with different people, different colors, different worldviews in this. So uh, for me, it's not inter uh, not surprising that you're interested in Mozart, even if I like Bach more. Yeah. Uh, is the answer meet your question, uh, Ibukun? Yeah, thank you so much for the explanation. Yeah, maybe the last one uh, from Rima. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your question, Ibu. Uh, I, want, uh, I can say that it's not based on the religion itself, but um, it's it was our tradition from our ancestors. So they got uh, married very uh, in their age. So that's why uh, maybe uh, they pushed the young generation to get married in their early age. But uh, actually, it was in the past and uh, based on our ancestors' traditions and customs, something like that, but not related with the religion. Uh, but nowadays, I think it's uh, it's the effect of uh, the union of youth of Uzbekistan uh, activities. It, it really changed. Nowadays, uh, people are uh, interested in getting education first and then get married uh, because we are having a lot of events or sure. meetings with young people, uh, the uh, disadvantages or the bad sides of getting uh, early uh, marriage because uh, when they get early marriage, uh, then a lot of divorces happened in Uzbekistan. So that's why they started to stop that kind of tradition to get married in their uh, early age. For example, uh, for myself, I got married in my uh, 29 years old, and that's normal now. But in the past, maybe uh, about 10 years ago, it was really surprising. Uh, so they got married when they are uh, 18 years old, so they were not interest in, uh, interested in uh, education or something like that. But nowadays, uh, people started to get education first and then marriage. And for myself also in my classroom, I always say for my students that if you can deal with the education, with the assignments, and at the same time with your family issues, then uh, it's okay to get married. If you don't, then just concentrate on your education and study first, and then you get married. And I also explained them that uh, when I uh, got married, then I still remember, because it happens in my classroom sometimes uh, before their uh, marriage, maybe for for two weeks, uh, they just uh, stop attending to the uh, class because they are uh, going to prepare for their wedding party. And then I I explained them uh, because I, I remember that when I was doing my PhD program at the Jukchakar State University, then I remember that I, I attended to my lecturer's classroom on my wedding day. In the morning, I attended to the class and in the, in the evening, I had my wedding party. So that's why uh, I 
tell them uh, I, I also tell them the effects of early marriage so uh, nowadays it's normal to get married in their appropriate age thank you very much ibu rima uh, so i know uh, uh, i know about the uh, the answer because uh, so i had concluded Uh, because Islamic religion from Arab, so some people in Indonesia uh, use all from Arab. S- Sometimes mm-hmm. the tradition they thought that this from religion. So, yeah. So that's thank you very much for your answer. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ibu. Didik, may I have a last chance to to? Say some words regarding the internationality. Yeah, yeah, Vito, please. Um, it's it's uh, regarding to to the uh, the question from uh, uh, Dr. Astunde. Uh, when I reflect my past, uh, the first time I came became really international was during my internship here in the company. Uh, that's really curious because uh, uh, they searched. I did my internship in the marketing department, and they searched a driver to to bring guests into the company. They said, you're well known to the streets of Würzburg. There's the, the, uh, the big uh, railway station from the airport Frankfurt. Please pick up all those uh, guests. And then I was faced with Japanese, Indian, Australians, the typical Americans. And that was the first time I was faced really international because uh, all those American style and all the Europeans are well known to us. Uh, so many people would say, you know, Susan is from the Netherlands, uh, but but they are close to us. And then the, uh, the, the, the Hollanders would say, the Germans are not close to us, but at least we, we understand them <laughs> in a certain way. So uh, that was the first time I, uh, I realized there are many different point of views uh, next to reading some newspapers, magazines or anything else. And the, the next step was attending the PhD st- uh, uh, studies uh, at the TU Dresden, when I had the chance to visit Chokchakarta. And this uh, uh, travel to Chokchakarta put me on, a, on another level because I guess the Western world is very, very centrific about the Western world, about Europe, about the US, and those people who are close to us, regardless the skin color. But uh, in Jakarta, I faced the first time a conference with people from Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Sri Lanka, and everything else. Countries I visited during holidays, but not get crowded on one place. And that's a very, very big uh, surplus and a very positive thing, which we could give to our children in any way. Can I add something to you? <clears throat> Um, in the Netherlands, the last couple of years, and especially for my university, one of the main objectives for the coming years is something we call inclusion. And what we try to do to, um, to, to uh, arrive at is that we become a school for everybody, uh, for any race, but also for any sexual um, uh, di- uh, direction, um, for people that are whatever, everybody has to feel at home in our universities. And what we do, we try to uh, educate our teachers in the university how to do this. And what we come at is that uh, cultural communication or intercultural communication is a very special thing because you think, you think in the, in the Netherlands, we think we're very open to everybody. We think we're very uh, liberal and everybody's everything is possible but in the end when you really start looking it's not the case when somebody has a Turkish back name and he uh, applies for a job on that name the chances are that he won't be invited because of his last name and so what we try to do in the Netherlands to become become very democratic by really getting into this so we teach us our teachers to be very much more uh, intercultural um, uh, sensitive so that everybody is included in our country. And I think um, maybe from the point of view of Indonesia, you think we're very open and and democratic, but in the end, inside people, it's not the case. So in our university, we're really working on inclusion, which I think is a very good thing. And I'm, uh, and it it comes back to your question, uh, uh, Dr. Stuti, Kun, dear Kun, that um, it's really a sensitivity to be that way. 
And it's a sensitivity that really needs to be uh, looked at very carefully, I think, in any school from primary school to high school to, to university, because it is a very special thing. Uh, even between Germans and the Netherlands, we might, you know, we might look the same, but yeah. uh, we know in the Netherlands that um, uh, we, we look upon German people as being far more um, strict and they're always on time. And in the Netherlands, we sort of go all the way. So even between two countries that are so close related, uh, there's a lot of cultural differences. And if you don't know about them, you might end up in a in a discussion that that you really don't need to be in because really the understanding goes underneath. So I just thought to add that to uh, this discussion. Yes, it is quite interesting to discuss about the intercultural actually because uh, actually I want uh, I'm uh, the one who have an experience because I have. I have been living in Germany for for my PhD, and I'm meeting uh, Peter and also uh, the colleague from Bolivia. We have also from China, so actually that is quite interesting. So we have already here uh, Ibu Martini for the license, please Ibu. Thank you. Uh... Can I, I mean, uh, audible? Can you listen my voice because yeah, the internet yeah. connection in my voice is not so good? Yeah, we can uh, Okay, yeah. yeah, thank you. May I ask a question? First of all, thank you very much to the participant, Ms. Susan, uh, Mr. Peter, uh, Rima, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a, a English teacher in a senior high school in Yogyakarta. And uh, I wanna ask a question about, uh, can uh, UNY, Yogyakarta State University, facilitate the, the English teacher to get uh, collaboration with native speaker from other countries to uh, facilitate the English teacher in every, student, every school in senior high school? because uh, the problem of the English teacher is about cross-culture understanding. Uh, they, they cannot teach English correctly, especially about uh, what is it, the cultures. Yeah, you know, when we teach English, we also must understand the culture where the language comes from. So it's the problem for us. And then I have tried to get, uh, what is it, uh, to get uh, uh, help from, certain foundation in the international levels but so far uh, they never never uh, fulfill our our proposal because you know the uh may school is not one of the leading school in Yogyakarta. usually only the good school that have a have a uh help about the teacher assistant i have tried to propose that so maybe uh, Yogyakarta State University can facilitate that, or maybe uh, Ms. Susan or Mr. Peter can help us how to get the teacher assistant for the English teacher in the school. Very much. Um, hello. Yeah, I, am, I hear a lot of other noise, but. I, uh -huh, yeah. So you're looking for um, uh, assistance for your teachers or for the students? Yeah, but but it's free because you know that in the government school like my school, and there is low budget about it. We we don't have any budget to uh, what is it to pay our uh, the native to 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 help us in teaching English. I think I think what's the 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 short the shortcut here is to find a school somewhere. Uh, and you uh -huh. can, I don't even think you need to go to uh, England, uh -huh. uh, but uh -huh. for example, in the Netherlands, where we uh, my uh -huh. child gets English and get um, something like this, get get an uh, get an exchange going, like something uh, something regular going between students, and then also get the teachers connected, like Dr. Kuhn and I uh, have been connected uh -huh. ten years, and we've been in touch. I think uh -huh. this doesn't have to do anything with. Um, uh, with money, because, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, high school, 
students, they're really interested in different uh, cultures and different um, in different countries. So I could imagine very well that um, having an exchange between classes could um, help with with um, all types of stuff, including English and but including intercultural. So. Um, uh, I, I would advise to look for a secondary school somewhere, um, and and just get a just get a relationship going. Uh, and I think you know I'm I'm always I'm almost willing to give you the address of my children's school. Who are both, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure the school would be uh, delighted. Mm. So so can I contact you uh, privately so you can help help us to get that how. Yeah, I, I will How yeah, do. Yeah, my my email is with the organization, so please email me. I will try and look for uh, for partners for schools. What what Susan says is uh, roughly the same thing I would have recommended. I guess it's yeah. I guess it's um, it's a possibility to get some uh, in Germany. They they are called partner schools, where a, a cooperation between different schools. Uh, could be mm -hmm. inside the country, outside the country. Uh, the first thing that came in my mind uh, when I was uh, 40 years younger, <laughs> uh, we had an exchange with, friend, uh, with France, yeah. uh, the German-French uh, friendship program, and uh, uh, the, the, the schools, the high schools uh, and the, the secondary schools offered so-called letter friendships, where um, two pupils were brought together, you have never seen the, your opposite, uh, the times before internet, and where you have to, to write your letters and send them every one and then uh, uh, to, between the countries. And uh, sometimes it's lasted very, very long. Also, this would be quite a fine thing. Uh, and those, um, yeah, uh, also some, some foster, uh, foster schools could be there, uh, what, what, what you can do, I guess. My girls are, they have, uh, my youngest is really into English. She's a big Harry Potter fan. So what she did, she actually looked on, I think it was TikTok or whatever. And some way or the other, she found, found an English uh, person. And they, they now, they chat every week. They have like, like an hour's talk like this. And they just speak to each other about their countries, about Harry Potter. about. Uh, so it could even be that it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to cost money. Yeah. Other than this, uh, you we may have uh, what is it a sister school to improve teachers' competency in using English as means of common practices at schools. I think, and I don't hope that the University of Jakarta is going to pick up the English teachers at the University. Uh, I mean, in Jakarta in particular, to improve their English. But, Live in the idea of in classroom management. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Malcona, for joining in this discussion. Okay. Actually, uh, Professor okay. Malcona okay. is uh, the vice president okay. uh, okay. okay. of the university. Uh, quite interesting discussion, uh, and I would like to if there is any question from other participant. If not yet, yeah, I have a question regarding, yeah, as we know that we, we are still in the COVID-19 uh, situations and uh, some uh, some countries, uh, the, the active uh, COVID-19 uh, decreasing, but the other is increasing, but the, the, the activity uh, uh, must be, uh, must be uh, run. And I would like to know, and what about, for example, for Peter, what about uh, to deal with the internship in the uh, in the COVID nineteen uh, situations, and also for Rima for the student community service, and as well for Susan for the teaching practicum. How do you deal with the COVID nineteen situation? And as we know that we cannot just meet. Uh, in persons, but uh, all of the activities switch to the online. Might be starting with Peter. Okay. Um, 
That's that's a, a very sensible question, <laughs> because here in Germany, uh, since two or three days, uh, they are talking about the fourth wave. Uh, numbers are, ri are rising, and uh, it's it's a hard thing about is vaccination mandatory? Is it not mandatory? Um, there are different tensions. Um, to talk about my my company or the companies I I'm, I'm looking into it. Um, uh, many many employees are coming back into the offices because uh, quite up to 70 percent and more are being vaccinated. Uh, you can see. Today I'm uh, alone here in the office, but uh, when we're in the office, we could drop off, uh, drop off our masks. Uh, if we are moving between the buildings, inside the buildings, we wear a mask. Uh, uh, it depends on the, the, the office crew, the office community, uh, what uh, the, the community is uh, trying to do. We stopped the internships last year when uh, the pandemic was, uh, when was new and was rising. Uh, now at the moment we're looking for those things, but it means that uh, in sensible surroundings where you uh, were close together and you could not, you're not allowed to ask for your employees to if you are, are you are vaccinated. Uh, that's that's not allowed in Germany. So uh, you could only depend on the answer and say yes, uh, we're vaccinated. Then you could have a, a, gentleman, a ladies and gentlemen agreement. Uh, to put off the mask, but uh, if there are different uh, persons, different office bases together, they wear masks. And you have restrictions uh, about uh, the, the number of persons inside the offices. So uh, the, that's not longer the, the topic for, for internships. But you, you're never, uh, you could be never safe that there are not uh, any uh, infections about that, but uh, there is no prejudice all from the outside comes in, uh, uh, every person from the outside uh, brings in the virus. So uh, we, we, we do it in a quite certain way and we still offer internships. Yeah, well, Rima. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in Uzbekistan, we had uh, online classes uh, just for six months, I, th I think, uh, last year in pandemic situation. But nowadays, we already moved to face-to-face -to -face, uh, traditional way of uh, educational system. And we are uh, in the classroom, just uh, keeping distance from each other and then wearing masks. Uh, yeah, just uh, following to the regulation. And uh, if somebody is sick, then we just let them go home and just uh, be isolated. Uh, so that's the case in my institution. Uh, we are dealing, we are still dealing with the um, uh, pandemic situation, but we already moved to the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching way. Uh, because in pandemic situation, it was really difficult to deal with the uh, uh, technological <clears throat> situations like internet connection. It was really slow and everybody suffered about it. And uh, and of course, in rural area, areas, they um, they don't, uh, they, they didn't have any uh, laptops or uh, technological instruments, for example, to, uh, to use uh, online classes so that's why we moved to face-to-face -to -face, uh, teaching way and um, for the previous question I, I wanted to add something if you agree but uh, for the question to collaborate with the school uh, I don't have any idea if in Uzbekistan we have a school uh, who wants to collaborate because I'm working at the university but I want to tell that uh, I will be really happy if you invite me as a speaker or as a presenter about the language and culture because uh, English is not my uh, second language or <laughs> native language but I I will be really glad if I share my experience, for example, in Indonesia about the culture shock or language and culture influence each other or some, something like that, because I've been in Indonesia for 10 years and I'm really happy if I uh, can do something for Indonesian uh, friends or people. So that's why I will be really glad if you if you invite me and it's free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> You know that what uh, what we must say. Uh, yeah. This one, this. 
Um, yeah, the pandemic, I, I'm saying I, we're on the same page as Germany. We're getting a fourth wave, but that's why my cold is getting worse, I think. <laughs> Where What I think is very um, um, interesting is in the Netherlands, we have a high percentage of vaccination, I think about 87%, but the 13% that's not vaccinated, they go on the streets and they demonstrate against the government getting them to vaccinate and then i look for example to brazil and people go on the street to get vaccinated so if we talk about intercultural differences i find that the pandemic pandemic really also divided our countries again there's countries screaming for vaccination in a lot of places in the world and then here we are in the netherlands and people are on the streets because they they think they need freedom and for both cases, you can say something, but um, I find that for me, the pandemic again um, made clear the differences in the world. And it's really getting my passion about how can we reconnect better? How can we get young people to build a better world for all of us? Um, in the Netherlands, the situation now is we are going to school. Government is saying school is the last place we sh should shut down because we had a lot of uh, psychological problems with young people, especially teenagers, getting really, really down and, uh, uh, well, in, in, because they were just home all the time behind their computers. We don't have trouble with bad internet, but we have trouble with young people being very stressed out. Um, so now the situation is we are going to school, um, everybody can do the stuff, but if you get sick, you go home and you, you wait five or six or seven days. Uh, and that's how we try to do it. But it's, I don't know. I think this pandemic taught us a lot uh, in how to deal with uncertainties in life. So um, I just wanted to add that to this discussion. Okay, thank you. So we have still around so uh, five minutes more. If uh, Papa Ipu has a question or something like to comment or giving a feedback to our presenters, uh, you may direct to speak up. Can I say something? Yeah. From Miss Martini, SM uh, Satu Sedayu. Okay, Bu, please. Okay, I'm really grateful that I got a lot of information about uh, collaborating. And I hope that we can contact further to uh, the speakers, uh, to Miss Susan or Miss Rima, also mm -hmm. Mr. Peter. So you know that our school in the pandemic, we have uh, online learning and teaching by uh, Luka Ghana Radio TV. So we invite the speaker from other places in our programs, kind of talk show. So maybe in the future, we can invite one of you or two of you or three of you to uh, be a speaker in our talk show to motivate our students about cross-cultural understanding and to motivate them to study English. So I'm very lucky to join this uh, uh, webinar because I get a lot of link from all of you, from all of you. So thank you very much. Thanks a million for this nice occasion. And we hope that we can have a next relationship in the next time. Thank you very much one again from UNJ, from Miss Susan, Miss Rima and Mr. Peter. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Terima kasih Bu Martini. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are going to the end of these sessions and for the token of appreciation, we may give a virtual applause to all excellent presenters. Thank you very much. So, and then I hand over this stage to Mrs. Nuni. Please, Mrs. Nuni. Thank you very much, um, Bapak Dr. Phil Insinyur Dr. Didi Haryanto for chairing the session. And also 
great appreciation is addressed to Mr. Peter Mr. Dogger, and also Ibrahima for their inspiring uh, insights to all of us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, coming up next, there are still two items to go before the closing. First of all, we are going to hear the closing speech by the Vice Rector uh, for Academic Affairs. And then after that, we are going to hear um, a publication briefing to all of you who are scheduled to submit the full paper to, uh, from the publication. Thank you very much once again. And ladies and gentlemen, um, as the closing speech, I'd like to invite Vice Rector for Academic Affairs of Universitas Negeri Yogyakarta to give a closing speech. Professor Dr. Margana M. Hum, MA, the floor is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace, God's blessings be upon all, all of us. Very good afternoon. <clears throat> First of all, let us thank the God, the Almighty, for blessing and for granting all means and opportunities together here to participate this very fruitful and tremendous occasion of the first international conference on practicum and community services in education as abbreviated ICO PCO. ICO PCC in 2021 through a virtual mode due to the COVID-19 pandemic as hosted by unit of teaching practicum, community services and industrial practicum of Yogyakarta State University. It is greatly honored and pleased for me as the first director for academic affairs to express many thanks to all invited speakers, namely Professor Dr. Siswan Doyo M. Kasaivo, Professor Christian Earth, Professor Dr. Thomas Koller, Professor Madia, Dr. Zainidun bin Yanudin bin Hassan, Professor Engineer Irvan Tuya. Prijambada M. Ng. PSG, my former student, Mbak Rimajun Sotikova, PSG, thank you, Professor Dr. Abdul Rahim bin Hamdan, Associate Professor Anthony Juran Ryan, Associate Professor Takahiko Matsui, Matsui, Professor Ko Ping Ling, Dr. Ansinyur Zainal Arifin, MT, Susan Luk, MSG, and Dr. Peter Dobler. Also, many thanks go to all delegates from many countries, all participants and committee members. I wish you can a fruitful and pleasant forum in this virtual conference in two days. We are looking forward to seeing you in the next two years at State University of Jakarta. I do hope not a virtual mode, but you can attend at State University of Jakarta, Indonesia. Therefore, with the great word of Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, it is a pleasure for me to declare the official closing of the first international conference on practicum and community services in education in 2021. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Well, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we have reached um, the end of the conference on practicum and community service in education. 
I believe that during these two days, all of us have obtained fruitful discussions. We have also learned a lot from the keynote session delivered by the amazing keynote speaker and 13 invited speakers who have shared their insightful ideas. Um, although this is the last day of the conference, the conference process is not over yet. There are still some steps that should be done. First, we will send you a reminder email regarding the publication of the submitted paper on November the 18th, 2021. Regarding this matter, we will select the papers and send them to a proceeding published by Atlantis Press. However, we cannot guarantee that your paper will be published by the publisher because the final decision will be decided by the publisher itself. The waiting time will also be various from one publisher to another. Therefore, we kindly ask for your patience. Second, please finish your paper according to the reviewer's comments and adjust your paper template according to the requirements of the Atlantis Press in which your paper is going to be published. The template can be downloaded later in the menu, download menu in the website. The deadline of the full paper submission is on November the 18, 2021. And we will also publish a local proceeding with ISBN for those who, prefers, who prefer to it and for those whose papers are not accepted by Atlantis Press. Further information will be presented by Bapak Alifi Nur Prastyo, MBD. Bapak Alifi, would you please take the floor? Baik, terima kasih. Sebelumnya, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, suara saya sudah terdengar, Jay, Bapak-Ibu semuanya. Sudah, Pak Alifi? Sudah Baik, terdengar. Uh, terima kasih, saya lanjutkan. Uh, terkait publikasi, nanti kita uh, akan mempublikasikan sembilan internasional ini ke Atlantis Press. Jadi mohon izin untuk share screen terkait informasi apa saja yang perlu kita persiapkan supaya paper-paper uh, yang akan kita kirimkan ini bisa diterima ke officer semua. Apa sudah terlihat? Belum, Pak. Belum, baru proses, Mas. Baik. Assalamualaikum. Apa sudah terlihat, Bapak Ibu? Belum. Belum. Belum, Pak. Belum, C. Belum muncul, Mas. Apa Oke, sudah terlihat? Ya, sudah ya. Oke, Bapak Ibu, mohon izin untuk menyampaikan. Ini uh, sekilas terdengar simpel, sederhana, tapi sebenarnya ini yang menentukan artikel atau paper Bapak Ibu nanti akan diterima oleh Atlantis Press atau akan di -reject. Nah, yang pertama, uh, kami sebagai panitia tidak bisa memberikan garansi terkait uh, paper yang Bapak Ibu kirimkan ke Atlantis Press karena nanti keputusan akhir Paper tersebut diterima ataupun tidak nanti yang sepenuhnya memutuskan adalah Atlantis Press. Nah, kita uh, upayakan sedemikian rupa supaya uh, paper dari Bapak Ibu ini bisa semuanya diterima di uh, publisher di Atlantis Press. Yang pertama yang perlu diperhatikan adalah uh, judul, terkait judul ini harus sesuai dengan scope, scope-nya pun harus sesuai dengan scope uh, seminar internasional kita. Kemudian terkait hal-hal teknis, yaitu terkait template, ini walaupun sederhana tapi mohon uh, dengan sangat ini untuk bisa di apa disesuaikan dengan apa yang diminta oleh Atlantis Press termasuk terkait judul di sini ada uh, ukurannya yang harus disesuaikan yaitu ukuran 20 
kemudian menggunakan font Times New Roman. Kemudian untuk subtitle ini juga harus disesuaikan sama-sama menggunakan Times New Roman, tapi ukurannya 16. Jadi ukuran font pun ini akan menjadi concern dari Atlantis Press. Kalaupun nanti tidak sesuai, pasti akan dikembalikan ke panitia untuk segera disesuaikan. Kemudian yang berikutnya adalah terkait penulisan autor maupun co-autor. Mohon untuk diikuti juga template dari Atlantis Press. Di sini template-nya berbeda dari dua atau tiga tahun yang lalu, karena ini menggunakan model baru di tahun 2021, yaitu nama autor maupun co-autor ini beriringan, jadi berjejer gitu ya. Kalau dulu ini berupa kolom sesuai dengan jumlah autor maupun co-autornya, sekarang berupa berjejer seperti ini. Kemudian untuk email ini uh, hanya untuk satu email saja di situ, jadi yang tipe satu. Untuk abstrak bisa disesuaikan, jadi nanti ditulis abstrak. Kalau biasanya kita tulis abstrak di tengah, ini kita sesuaikan template, tulisan abstraknya juga harus uh, left, artinya ada di sebelah kiri. Untuk keywords, ini juga kadang kita kelupaan untuk memberikan tanda koma, dan itu nanti juga pasti akan di cek sama atau express di situ kalau lebih dari satu keywordnya itu harus dipisahkan menggunakan tanda koma. Kemudian terkait uh, headings ini juga sering kita apa ya dikembalikan lagi ya sama atau express ini untuk diperbaiki untuk headingnya. Merupakan yang pertama merupakan first, kemudian second, third dan lain sebagainya itu juga harus disesuaikan untuk yang first ini. Uh, Caps lock semua, huruf besar semua, dengan ukuran 11,5. Jadi ini tidak 12 ya, tapi 11,5. Kemudian untuk uh, dalam apa isi tulisannya ini juga ukurannya 10, jadi kecil-kecil. Kemudian yang perlu diperhatikan kalau kita sudah pakai apa office yang terbaru, 365 ataupun tahun-tahun yang baru, ini di save as menjadi... Uh, Word 97 strip 2003 dokumen jadi ekstensinya adalah DOC bukan DOC. Kenapa? Karena nanti uh, ketika di apa dijadikan file artikel itu nanti supaya tidak pecah-pecah tidak kemana-mana. Untuk papernya sendiri menggunakan ukuran A4. Jadi tolong disesuaikan. Paling mudah adalah uh, Bapak Ibu download uh, template ini nanti akan di share di website seminter kita. Jadi nanti silakan di download, kemudian diedit saja. Jadi tidak perlu membuat baru, kemudian disetting sedemikian rupa, tapi uh, template ini bisa diedit sesuai dengan kebutuhan Bapak Ibu. Kemudian untuk uh, beberapa hal di sini untuk apa? Setelah subab-subab sesuai dengan paper Bapak Ibu ini yang perlu disertakan adalah uh, ada dua ini yang sering kelupaan, author contribution dengan acknowledgement. Jadi ini kadang tidak ada, jadi sebaiknya disesuaikan atau diadakan sesuai dengan uh, tulisan Bapak-Ibu. Kalaupun tidak ada, nanti Atlantis Press pasti akan meminta untuk diadakan. Kemudian terakhir, Bapak-Ibu, ini yang cukup apa ya cukup penting banget, ya yaitu terkait reference, karena kemarin uh, beberapa... Tidak hanya beberapa, tapi banyak sekali artikel yang dikembalikan ke panitia, yaitu terkait penulisan reference. Jadi ini di Atlantis Press menggunakan angka, yang mana angka tersebut ditutup menggunakan uh, simbol semacam ini, kurung buka, kurung tutup, yang bentuknya menyiku. Dan itu nanti disesuaikan dengan uh, kutipan yang digunakan. Jadi nanti di situ ada satu, dua, tiga, dan seterusnya. Jadi berbeda seperti uh, apa penulisan reference yang lain. Seperti itu Bapak-Ibu untuk sedikit teknis, jadi nanti bisa disesuaikan dengan template yang akan di-share di website. Jadi untuk diterima atau tidak, itu nanti yang memutuskan ada Atlantis Press. Tapi kita berupaya sebaik mungkin, yang pertama uh, harus sesuai scope, jadi jangan apa melewati atau keluar dari skop karena itu pasti nanti akan apa kedetek oleh Atlantis Express. Kemudian yang kedua adalah untuk similarity-nya, jadi nanti akan kami cek tingkat similarity-nya menggunakan turnitin. 
supaya nanti juga tidak apa sia-sia ya sudah ke review ke publisher tapi ternyata ketika mereka cek uh, itu ada similarity-nya dan itu nanti akan ada charge tambahan dan itu nanti akan dibebankan ke panitia. Jadi sebelum kita akan kirim ke Atlantic Express itu nanti akan kita cek dulu turnitinnya. Sehingga kalau sudah clear turnitinnya oke okay, itu nanti kita bisa uh, kirimkan ke publisher. Baik Bapak Ibu, uh, demikian sedikit yang bisa kami sampaikan untuk teknis uh, publikasi ke Atlantis Press. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bapak Ibu barangkali ada yang ingin ditanyakan terkait kejelasan publikasi. Silakan. Izin Ibu. Silakan Bapak. Ya, terima kasih Ibu. Izin Pak Alfi menanyakan pertama jumlah minimal uh, favor. Yang kedua adalah tadi minta penegasan berarti untuk referensi ini dalam bentuk enak Pak ya. Itu aja Pak mau menanyakan. Terima kasih atas jawaban. Mohon maaf yang terakhir tadi apa juga? Tentang referensi Pak itu dalam bentuk enak atau gimana ya? Referensi Pak Alfi. Untuk referensi itu nanti langsung berupa model angka-angka ya Bapak Ibu hmm. sesuai dengan yang di template. Jadi nanti uh, berupa kayak setelah kita menggunakan referensi, uh, kita setelah mengutip sesuatu itu nanti uh, setelah kalimat tersebut diberikan tanda apa itu kurung yang kotak itu misal angka satu langsung dikurung tutup. Kemudian nanti mengarah ke paling bawah sendiri. Jadi angka satu tadi mengutip menggunakan uh, referensi mana. Kalau ternyata hmm. lebih dari satu itu bisa dikasih koma kemudian kotak buka lagi, angka 2 misal, kemudian kotak tutup, kemudian di paling bawah lagi, uh, disesuaikan lagi itu referensi yang ambil dari mana. Oh, kemudian mereka. kalau lebih dari satu bisa diberikan koma-koma seperti itu. Berarti referensi dalam bentuk enak Pak ya? Betul, betul. Dan tidak memiliki daftar pustaka lagi Pak ya? Ya. Mas. Kalau jumlah minimal halaman Pak, daftarnya? Pertanyaan. Apakah referensi itu bisa menggunakan Mendeley itu ya? Itu kan berarti Apa seperti itu. Untuk menggunakan bantuan Mendeley itu bisa, cuma nanti harus disesuaikan uh, seperti yang diminta Atang Express yaitu berupa angka dengan apa tanda kurung menggunakan apa itu, yang kotak-kotak seperti itu. Jumlah minimal favornya nggak ditentukan apa? Untuk jumlah minimal paper, sebentar saya cek sebentar. Uh, bisa antara 5 sampai 7, saran saya di sekitar 7. Jadi nanti kalaupun ada penyesuaian dari Atlantis Press, kita masih punya apa stok halaman di situ. Jadi tidak perlu berhalaman banyak-banyak, eh, sekitar 5 sampai 7. Terima kasih, Pak. Uh, maksudnya berapa ribu kata itu ya? Kurang lebih. Soalnya halaman kan uh, bisa beda, spasi satu setengah. Ada berapa halaman Pak Alifi? Ada berapa ribu kata per halaman? Ada berapa kata, mohon maaf. Baik, sebentar saya cek. Oh iya. Sekalian Pak Alifi mungkin bisa nanti disampaikan tentang biaya pendaftar biaya untuk penerbitannya nanti bisa dijelaskan. Ibu juga nanti dikirim ke mana ya Bu? Kalau sudah kami... papernya ya? Iya kalau sudah kami perbaiki kemudian dikirim ke mana? Ya. Baik uh, Pak Alifi sementara sedang menyiapkan uh, yang akan disampaikan. Mohon izin untuk menjawab, Ibu, untuk full paper kami beri batas waktu sampai dengan tanggal 18 November jam 23.59, di-upload di web seperti Ibu kemarin mengupload abstrak. 
Tetapi nanti dipilih yang menunya adalah revise full paper ya Ibu. Ya. Tapi tentunya kami akan tidak lelah-lelahnya akan memberikan reminder kepada email kepada Bapak Ibu melalui email kita. Si panitia. Makasih banyak Ibu. Ya, sama-sama Ibu. Silakan mungkin ada pertanyaan yang lain sambil menunggu Pak Alifi memberikan jawaban. Mungkin bisa jelaskan tadi Bu tentang biaya tadi. Oh iya, tentang biayanya. Ini juga sekaligus jawaban lengkapnya ada di Bapak Alifi ya. Kita tunggu beliau untuk menjelaskan tentang biaya publikasinya. Tanggalnya tadi tanggal berapa Bu? 18 nggih. 18 November Ibu, 18 November jam 23.59. Ya, sama-sama. Kemudian setelah itu, setelah Bapak Ibu mengumpulkan atau menyerahkan atau submit full paper, kami akan melakukan review, kemudian kami akan memberikan feedback atau hasil review akan kami kirimkan kepada Bapak Ibu sebagai bahan untuk merevisi full paper. Kemudian full paper yang sudah direvisi tersebut nanti uh, dimohon untuk diupload kembali di website. Uh, prosedur lengkapnya nanti akan kami jelaskan di email kami yang akan kami kirimkan setelah konferensi selesai. Ya, Ibu, mungkin lebih baik juga pas template-nya di emailnya, Bu. Pas Ibu uh, oh iya, atau... terkait dengan template, template yang tadi disampaikan oleh Pak Alifi, ada dua yang ingin kami sampaikan. Pertama, template akan kami upload di website, bisa di-download di menu download. Selain itu, Bapak-Ibu, kami juga akan mengirimkan template itu ke email Bapak-Ibu masing-masing sambil kami nanti menginfokan beberapa hal terkait dengan publikasi. Harapannya nanti secepatnya hari ini, hari Kamis, ya dalam minggu ini, dan akan kami eksekusi pengiriman templatenya secepat mungkin, kami upayakan besok sudah terkirim kepada Bapak-Ibu semua untuk templatenya. Alhamdulillah. Bisa di, segera ditindak lanjuti. Mohon maaf, Ibu Nuni boleh bertanya? Boleh, silakan. Ya, Ibu Nuni, kalau misalnya ternyata eh, kami sudah mengirimkan full paper, apakah bisa mendapatkan eh, hasil dari re review atau masukan dari reviewer seperti itu? Ya. Baik, terima kasih. Nanti begitu Ibu submit paper pada tanggal 18 November, tim reviewer eh, akan bekerja mereview artikel Bapak Ibu semuanya kemudian dan itu review akan dilakukan secara sistem jadi by system jadi otomatis nanti feedback akan bisa langsung Bapak Ibu akses di website dengan klik menggunakan login akun Bapak Ibu masing-masing nah berdasarkan hasil review itu Bapak Ibu disilakan untuk merevisinya demikian apakah sudah terjawab Maksud saya kalau uh, sudah uh, submit uh, full papernya uh, sekarang itu apakah bisa sebelum tanggal 18 mendapat Oh baik. ini terima kasih masukan karena memang nanti kami juga uh, khawatir pada tanggal 18 itu ada tsunami artikel ya jadi kalau Bapak Ibu sudah mengirimkan artikel tim reviewer akan segera bekerja untuk memberikan uh, reviewnya Terima kasih mengingatkan. Jadi tidak untuk reviewer akan bekerja, tidak harus menunggu tanggal 18. Begitu Bapak Ibu submit full paper, ada notifikasi pada kami, kami akan eksekusi. Ya. Ibu Ibu Nuni, satu lagi. Sehubungan dengan sertifikat itu atau surat tugas atau bagaimana supaya saya bisa lapor ke universitas saya itu? Oh iya, baik. Ini Pak Alifi akan segera, saya satu lagi ya Pak Alifi terkait sertifikat, mohon izin menjelaskan. Bapak-Ibu, sertifikat ini terbagi menjadi beberapa kategori. Yang pertama adalah sertifikat sebagai presenter, ini diberikan kepada Bapak-Ibu yang memang sudah submit abstrak dan presentasi. Untuk uh, yang ini, akan kami ada dua versi cara juga. Yang pertama, kami akan upload di uh, website, Kemudian juga bisa kami kirimkan kepada Bapak Ibu melalui email. Paling lambat akan kami kirimkan hari Senin, Ibu. Ya, terima kasih Ibu. Ya, sama-sama. 
Karena sudah mau Desember biasa Bu masuk KKD ya. Iya. <laughs> iya. Iya Ibu, apa tadi tidak kurang jelas terdengar? Iya, soalnya mau masuk Desember Bu. Nah, oh iya, baik. Harus... Baik Ibu, kami akan pastikan bahwa paling lambat kami akan upload dan kirimkan ke email Bapak Ibu khususnya untuk ini untuk presenter ya. Itu hari Senin. Kemudian Bapak Ibu yang partisipan artinya peserta yang tidak berpresentasi tentunya akan kami kirimkan ke email masing-masing seperti yang tertera pada link presensi. Di sana kami memiliki data alamat email bagi Bapak Ibu yang join Zoom sebagai partisipan. Nah, akan kami kirimkan ke email Bapak Ibu semuanya. Demikian Ibu, apakah sudah terjawab? Terima kasih Ibu. Ya, sama-sama. Kemudian Bapak Ibu sebelum ke Pak Alifi lagi, satu hal lagi. Tadi di uh, chat kami kirimkan Google Form untuk evaluasi kegiatan. Dimohon Bapak Ibu berkenan untuk mengisinya. Sebagai feedback bagi kami untuk penyelenggaraan yang lebih baik lagi ke depannya. Terima kasih. Begitu Pak Alfi silakan. Terima kasih Bu Nuni. Mohon izin jawab Bapak Ibu. Terkait pertanyaan berapa jumlah kata di dalam satu artikel, ini berkisar sekitar 4.000 kata. Kalau halaman, paling mudah halaman itu sekitar, eh, tadi itu 5-7 halaman. Kemudian terkait biaya, ini juga menyesuaikan dengan jumlah artikel yang masuk ke penerbit, jadi nanti akan dihitungkan oleh penerbit, ini nanti eh, sesuai tidak dengan batas minimal yang eh, ditentukan oleh penerbit. Jadi nanti akan kita informasikan terkait uh, jumlah biaya per artikel per autor itu berapa. Karena selain ada beberapa tahapan yang harus diselesaikan oleh penerbit, itu juga ada uh, uji similarity, kemudian ada juga untuk uh, setting website di uh, website Atlantis Press, sehingga nanti belum terbit pun di situ sudah ada uh, keterangan akan terbit di uh, kapan dengan nama konferensi uh, seperti itu. Mohon izin Pak, bertanya boleh? Boleh, silakan. Ya Pak Alifi, ini, ini berarti uh, untuk penerbitannya, ini apakah penerbitan Atlantis Press untuk yang ke jurnal atau ke proceeding ya? Terima kasih. Untuk penerbitan, Jih, Maturman, Bu Yeni, atas pertanyaannya, ini menggunakan Atlantis Press berupa proceeding. Jadi proceeding conference, seperti itu. Uh, mau tanya lagi, berarti jika yang tidak lolos di Atlantis itu nanti masuknya proseding yang ISBN, begitu ya Mas? Betul, jadi di seminar ini kita juga ada opsi lain yang di atas space, yaitu proseding per ISBN, seperti itu Bu Kusno. Kira-kira untuk uh, tahu jawabannya diterima di Atlantis itu berapa lama ya Mas Terus bisa diputuskan masuk ke ISBN begitu maksudnya? Baik ini tergantung dari kesiapan artikel yang uh, Bapak Ibu nanti akan kirimkan. Nanti kalau sudah siap mohon segera dikirimkan sesuai dengan template. Itu nanti akan direview oleh tim reviewer supaya sesuai dengan scope yang pertama. Kemudian nanti kalau sudah sesuai dengan scope conference kita, nanti kita akan uji similarity, kalau sudah oke, okay, kita segera kirimkan. Dan proses itu tidak terlalu lama, Bapak-Ibu, jadi nanti mereka uh, cukup fast respon. Uh, biasanya sekitar 3-7 hari itu sudah ada jawaban dari Atlantis Press, sehingga nanti bisa kita segera teruskan ke author. Misal kalau uh, artikelnya diterima, itu nanti akan ada invoice yang apa menunjukkan sejumlah nominal yang akan dibayarkan kepada publisher seperti itu. Oke, terima kasih Mas. Pak Alifi, apakah bisa dibantu menjelaskan terkait biayanya, Pak Alifi? Jih, Bu Nuni, untuk biaya ini dari Antris Press biasanya menghitung juga dengan jumlah artikel yang masuk. Semakin banyak artikel yang masuk, tentu biayanya akan semakin murah. Apabila nanti artikelnya kurang, itu nanti kita akan kena apa semacam cas 
uh, biaya tambahan supaya uh, batas minimal yang diminta oleh Atlantis Express itu terpenuhi. Karena proses di Atlantis Express itu sudah ada semacam POB-nya, ada SOP-nya gitu, tahapan-tahapannya. Mulai dari cek similarity, kemudian nanti set up di website itu ada uh, biaya tersendiri dan biasanya kita akan bagi biaya tersebut ke seluruh autor. Jadi nanti tidak begitu berat uh, untuk autor membayar. Jadi belum tahu perkiraannya Pak ya. <laughs> Apakah bisa diberikan gambaran kira-kira berapa range-nya walaupun tidak persis? Kalau tidak persis kemungkinan di antara uh, antara 1 sampai 2 juta Bapak Ibu. Jadi tidak apa ya tidak Autor pasti di artikel. antara harga seperti itu. Per artikel ya. Per artikel, betul per artikel. Bukan per author ya. Bukan per author, per artikel. Tentu kalau semua artikel yang masuk ke conference ini bisa uh, lanjut ke alternative press, tentu nanti juga lebih murah lagi nanti kita biaya publikasinya seperti itu. Izin Pak Alvi. Izin Pak Rivi, monggo. Uh, uh, menambah, melanjutkan pertanyaan dari kawan-kawan uh, sebelumnya. Uh, jika nanti uh, artikel kita accepted, ini proses pembayaran apakah langsung ke Atlantis atau ke panitia uh, ekop kosi ini? Baik, terima kasih Pak Rivi atas pertanyaannya. Jadi nanti semua biaya dari paper itu nanti akan dikumpulkan ke panitia dan nanti akan secara kolektif ditransferkan ke Atlantis Press. Jadi nanti kita akan transfer uh, menggunakan uh, skema luar negeri gitu ya. Jadi nanti ke teller. Kemudian nanti ada beberapa hal yang apa detail untuk rekening tujuan di Atlantis Press itu yang harus kita siapkan di situ. Jadi nanti supaya mempermudahkan juga dan nanti lebih mudah dicek juga untuk publisher apakah sudah masuk atau belum. Karena untuk mengecek pun mereka juga butuh waktu karena uh, akhir-akhir ini cukup banyak konferensi yang dilakukan tidak hanya di Indonesia seperti itu, Pak Rivi. Jadi secara... Baik Mas, terima kasih. Uh, sangat membantu presenter kami ini. Karena pengalaman kalau uh, individu yang langsung luar biasa sulit uh, untuk uh, mentransfer atau mengirim ke pihak manusia atau ke jurnal itu. Terima kasih Mas atas bantuannya. Ini sangat mempermudah Mas. Baik Pak Rivi, terima kasih. Jadi sekali lagi Bapak Ibu mohon dengan sangat ya untuk bisa menyesuaikan artikelnya dengan template yang diminta Atlantis Press. Entah itu ukuran font, kemudian format fontnya, titik komanya itu mohon betul-betul diperhatikan supaya sesuai dengan apa yang diminta oleh Atlantis Press. Silakan Bapak Ibu apakah masih ada pertanyaan? Izin Ibu. Silakan Bapak. Ya, terkait untuk revise paper, revisi artikel kita nanti setelah mengikuti konferen dua hari ini, kemudian di presentasi kemarin itu ada diskusi, masukan dan semacam. Pertanyaan saya Kalau kita melakukan sedikit perubahan kepada judul artikel kita, ini, ini apakah sebelum nanti misalnya ada review review dari reviewer dalam proses merevisi nanti sebelum kita kirim ini judul artikel boleh kita sempurnakan atau bagaimana atau mesti sesuai dengan aftra dengan judul yang sudah kita kirim kemarin? Silakan Bapak bila bila dirasa masih ada yang perlu disempurnakan pada judul paper 
mungkin ada perubahan dari judul yang kemarin dikirimkan. Saya kira tidak apa-apa, Bapak. Jadi itulah fungsinya di review. Kemudian setelah diskusi sesama teman presenter di ruangan, kemudian juga masukan dari reviewer, silakan tetap terbuka untuk direvisi apakah itu judulnya ataupun mungkin ide-ide di dalamnya. Begitu Bapak, sudah jelas? Ibu, terima sangat. Ibu, Bapak. Apakah masih ada yang ingin dikonfirmasi kepada Pak Alifi, mumpung beliau masih bersama kita, Bapak dan Ibu? Mungkin sambil menunggu Bapak-Ibu, kita masih ada waktu sekitar 10 menit untuk sesi ini. Bapak dan Ibu perlu kami informasikan bahwa eh, kami akan eh, terus mengontak Bapak-Ibu melalui email sebagai reminder, terutama Bapak-Ibu yang nanti pada tanggal-tanggal menegati tanggal 18 belum mengirimkan, akan kami kirim email secara intens. begitu ya. Kemudian eh, selanjutnya bila ada Pertanyaan terkait publikasi bisa disampaikan ke kami melalui email conference yang selama ini kita berkomunikasi menggunakan email tersebut. Insya Allah kami akan berupaya sebaik mungkin untuk melayani pertanyaan Bapak Ibu di email. Ibu Ibu Nuni lagi, ini bukan maksa tapi mohon maaf, mungkin kalau bisa besok jadi kita bisa memperbaikinya pas weekend, Bu. Karena kalau nggak weekend agak susah. Karena kan kami mengajar sama seperti Ibu. Iya, Ibu pada prinsip